Hi everybody, welcome to FNS Wrestling Podcast, episode 87, I guess technically B, as I did. Yeah, you could call it 87. I did put out 87A yesterday, which was, the normal format is to have any other wrestling business near the end of the show, but this week I think any other wrestling business is what I recorded yesterday. So this episode might be a bit shorter than usual. I always say that and then it never is, so I don't know why I think that, but... I should say it'll be a bit longer than usual to And then it'll be a pleasant surprise when it's not. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, if you did listen yesterday, I I put out a solo mission talking about this week's Impact Wrestling, um, just so that we did have something out on a Saturday, because I don't like to miss a day, because that's just how I am. And Jack was away yesterday at a function, so he is back today, and as promised, I said in our banter, we would probably discuss what was a pretty hectic week for us. Yeah. Um, Initially was our March break here in Southern Ontario. So that means we have a week off from school and work. We were looking forward to a nice, relaxing holiday. And no, because the FNS household got COVID. More specifically, I did. Yeah, and then I kind of got the same symptoms and tested negative three times. Right, so Jack's voice, as you can tell, sounds interesting. Well, it's actually not as bad as yesterday. No, that's part of the reason we pushed recording. His voice was crazy. It was really bad. Like, this is like... Better. Still kind of sick sounding, but it's like, uh, it's doable, I think. So basically, um, we were going to visit relatives last Saturday, a week from today, and uh, my younger son had, well, he said his throat felt weird, I think is what it was, right? Something like that. So we were going to visit relatives with young kids, so we all took rapid tests that um, schools in southern Ontario, or in Ontario, I guess, provided. Oh, then I tested negative four times. Right. So we all tested on Saturday. We were negative. We yep. went to the function hung out with them came back my throat started hurting on monday mine was like starting to feel weird like monday night right it was just kind of like bugging me but i thought it'd be like one of those things where it kind of goes away right and then so tuesday we were supposed to go with my younger son's basketball team to watch the globetrotters um but i was feeling a bit ill so we decided we would all test again and everybody but me tested negative so i tested positive i've been isolating since then so officially out of isolation today right. um tested myself this morning and it came mm-hmm. back negative i still have some lingering symptoms i probably yeah, sound a bit off somehow jack had the same symptoms i did yeah never... so like it got like a little worse like the general progression of this kind of thing for me is i remember it happened a week in uh, november too because mm-hmm. i remember the one friday at school i was just drinking like so much water like, but it was way COVID too much right? and like so like my throat hurt and then like tuesday kind of got worse i think like i was starting to like cough a bit and then wednesday it was like that was my brutal day i right. was like my head was bugging me my throat was still my throat was like a little better but then i sounded like crap i was coughing a lot my nose was right bad like i think i showered and took a bath that day crazy like it was so despite really jack bad. testing negative multiple times we just sort of treated him as positive yeah, because it, it was like he had the same symptoms yeah, i did so yeah, we yeah. kind of isolated him as well you're hibernating up in your room yes i've been <laughs> i'm out of hibernation now we've even yeah. I mean, behind the curtain, we're recording in a different spot because normally we record in a studio that is our studio is like 60 square feet. It's smaller than some people's closets. So um, (laughs) without a ton of ventilation. So I thought I'd move it up to the kitchen where we can get further away from each other a little bit and have a few Mm. windows open. Mm. Um, Your brother and mother are out of the house. So hopefully it won't get too loud up here. But um, yeah, so I mean, I full disclosure have all my vaccinations and so do you. So I'm double vaxxed and boosted and I still had symptoms. I would say I was very sick for a day and a half and then kind Same. of kind of sick for a couple more days, right? Yeah, that's so fair. probably the vaccination doing its job and keeping our symptoms pretty mild. However, the one symptom I discovered um, that I'm oh. not enjoying is that I have lost my sense of smell, ladies and gentlemen. I think I did pretty much as well, but like I didn't notice a lot. So I was, I think it was, so tested positive Tuesday, and then on Wednesday I was washing my hands up in the, the washroom. Right, room. yeah, and you came down to like... Smell them, everything. Because they, they weren't here, right? I remember you... Like, right, and so down. we have very fragrant hand soap generally, right? And this is like vanilla almond something, so yeah. I, I've noticed it and couldn't smell it. So you came down to like test the vinegar. Then I had a shower and smelled all of the shampoos and body washes, <laughs> couldn't smell anything, and then I just got fascinated, so I came down and was smelling vinegar and smelling Worcestershire sauce and nothing. So Mm -hmm. it's a pretty weird sensation. Um, Apparently anywhere from 
a couple weeks to several months it could be without smell so i don't enjoy it to be honest i don't think about it much but it is kind of weird like you don't smell any cooking you don't smell anything so Mm. even i took like our um air freshener sprayed a whole bunch of it in a small room couldn't smell it it's just a bizarre sensation but anyways um so that's kind of our lengthy update we're on the mend looks like we're done with covid and listen people it's just like i as I said, I have all my vaccinations and I would describe myself as more cautious than the average person. I wear my mask. We're still in mask mandates in Ontario until tomorrow, actually. So yeah. um, their masks are gone in general and in schools. So I've been super careful. I don't see a ton of people outside of my home and work, but uh, obviously it is still possible to get COVID, but a mild, pretty mild case for me. It was rough for about a day and a half there, yeah. but feeling a lot better. So I apologize if our sound quality due to A, recording in a much larger open space and be both of us our sort actual of sound coming off sickness um so hopefully you guys can bear with us everything should be back to normal next week mm-hmm. that's also why we're a day late we were just trying to wait out jack's voice and everybody feeling better and i was hoping um, i'm officially done isolation today and tested negative so it just made sense to wait that extra day so hope you don't mind and hope you checked out the impact review i put out yesterday um, but I don't know. Anything else you want to talk about um, in banter? I've been watching a lot of movies. You have been? Um, I think it was like Monday or Tuesday. I watched both of the Tom Hardy Venom movies back to back. And then I watched the first Captain America and like half of Captain Marvel. And anything good or and, bad? Um, I like the Venom movies. Those are good. Nice. Um, the second Venom was, remember, I saw it back to back days in theaters. Right. Um, and then I like the first Captain America. Captain Marvel sucks. I don't like Brie Larson. Right. I don't um, know who that is, but I, I've heard uh, her name. I, I I'm aware like she I don't like the exists. movie in general, but, and then I watched Iron Man 1, which everyone loves. I don't, I think it's good, but I just don't, I'm not a big Iron Man guy. Right. I think RDJ is good, but I just don't love Iron Man in general. What is RDJ? Robert Downey Jr. Oh, okay. Um, and then, Him I know, he's old enough. And then I watched, um, well, I tried, I watched like half of Hulk the day I was like super sick Wednesday, but like I yep. just didn't feel like it. So then I watched Jumanji in the tub and then I finished Hulk, which is, um, you know, Ed Norton. I do it's know Ed one. Norton. Uh, th- that movie sucks. Yeah. Um, and then I watched, then I think it was like Friday. I watched four movies. Nice. I watched Iron Man 2, Thor, Avengers, and Thor 2. So you crushed movies during your isolation and I crushed yeah. March Madness. So that was what got mm-hmm. me through because... March my, Madness my started. five movies today. Wow, that's gross. I would like. You still need to get some science work done too, probably, that's true. right? I'll so take multitask. some time to do that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much an update yeah. from us. I've just been binge watching the, I I Clone Wars, I think. the March Madness tournament, enjoying that. It's actually on in the background right now since we're in a space with a TV in it. So I've got it muted in the background mm-hmm. here. But uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm ready to talk about some wrestling. Are you? That was yeah. a lot of banter for us. For All sure. right, so let's move, I was gonna say. move into our first segment and talk about some of the week's wrestling news and rumors. So to take a look at some of the ratings this week, I've even uh, I'm gonna check in with Impact because uh, I watched it, I liked it this week, so I the ratings came across my desk, I guess, as I was looking at things, so I included it too. But let's start it with um, NXT 2.0. So Tuesday was the post roadblock edition of 2.0, and it did 624,000 viewers, up 1.79%, earned a 0.14 in the key demographic, up 7.69%. So this was the third best audience this year so far, the key demo rating second best this year. So um, my fear is that, and I do have a story later about how WWE, or sorry, the network they're on is happy with these ratings. So my fear is that these decent ratings, like over 600,000, um, because there was a lot of main roster crossover this week. So I'm really hoping that WWE oh. doesn't take the message of, oh, if we bring Miz and other main roster people, the ratings are good. So I it, remember they did that a few times in like because I don't early want that. developmental NXT, like 2012, 2013. Because I know like yes, they I've did. watched videos about how like Isaac Orton and yep. like and like big show of main appearances and whatnot like or jericho yep so it feels like this week was the most main rostery i think it's felt in terms of people coming back which i personally am not a fan of at all which i'll talk about when we yeah. get there but the uh, the one made no sense to me right the first one the opener probably no i'd say the mysterious oh that too yeah I, just like because like a couple just of like, them made no sense I was just to like me. what um, and then, so Wednesday's live St. Patrick's Day edition of AEW drew 933,000 viewers, which is up just over Whoa, 5%. St. Patrick's Day slam, all right. Sorry. And earned a 0. 
in the key demographic, which was down 5%. So these numbers are nothing either amazing or bad, just kind of falls right in the middle of where they've generally been since moving to TBS. So seems like between 900 and a million um, tends to be their normal number sort of thing. So probably nothing wrong with that and a decent number in the demographic. Mm -hmm. And then let's contra <coughs> contrast that with impact ratings. I did review the show this week, talked about it yesterday, really liked the show, actually contained a couple matches I recommend people see. Motor City Machine Guns uh, at Bullet Club was excellent, and I actually thought the main event, even though I'm not a Taven fan, I really like Taven Alexander as well, so I did recommend yeah, those. you love Alexander. I do love Alexander. Um, so the ratings for the Tuesday, sorry, Thursday's taped edition of Impact Wrestling drew, oh my goodness, 68,000 viewers. What, impact that's not many that is very uh, they should, like, it's usually it a little bit it's usually just over a hundred thousand which is is low already so sixty eight thousand viewers which is down almost twenty eight percent and earned a point zero two in the key demographic which is down over thirty three percent so it is the second lowest audience ever for impact since it moved to axis in December of two thousand nineteen but to be fair March Madness is well underway on the, on Thursday, so that is probably most likely to blame for the low ratings, but still 68,000 viewers, that is not good. I was one of them. Not live, though, so I guess I don't count in those numbers, and we're not a Nielsen, part of the problem. a Nielsen family or whatever it's called that are count in the ratings, but really low, but anyways. Uh, You're and, what's wrong with America. No. Um, do you mind if I take the first story because yeah, it's, it's it. tied in? So this is regarding um, basically the USA Network. Apparently, officials there are happy with the TV viewership numbers for NXT 2.0. So according to Andrew Zarian of the Matt Men Wrestling Podcast, who, quote, had a conversation with someone from USA, is, is what the source is here, that USA is happy with the current NXT ratings. Um, just basically to paraphrase the relevant part here. Uh, USA is fine with the numbers in the 600,000s since when NXT was basically the super indie loaded with talent, right? It was still only doing in the 700,000s, um, which is kind of the number networks hope for when they get special episodes of current NXT, but apparently they are happy with numbers in the 600,000s for just regular episodes. Um, so again, for me, this is terrible news since basically if USA is happy with the ratings and NXT, they're even mm, less they're not going to make it better right there's less motivated to change anything right there's no pressure from the network saying listen this is a terrible product and we're not happy with the ratings um the fact i think remains it's a terrible product it but, is but they are i guess not displeased with the ratings. so i imagine this means it'll be status quo business as usual um we're they're going to double down on the nonsense that we already get more than likely and maybe this trend of sort of blurring the lines between main roster, although it, that's probably due to WrestleMania season, but they could decide to keep doing also, it. Also, I so. feel like it's like, I feel like it's different if like you have Raw guys going to SmackDown where that's, that's like, why are they going to the other brand where NXT is clearly not a third brand? Like, I feel like anyone right. just go there. Like, obviously, I still think it's dumb, yeah. but like, I feel like it's not like, oh, they're going to another brand even though they're on Raw or they're on SmackDown. And like, if you're a main roster jobber, just come on down and now you're top of the card too, right? You're yeah, automatically I, I, a bigger deal in NXT. Yeah, I think our truth should win the North American title. He you just know? might. Uh, what do you have for us? Uh, let me see. So um, our favorite boy, our big favorite bald good forearm hitting boy, uh, Killer Cross is heading to New Japan on April 1st. I really hope that's an April Fool's joke, but it is not. Uh, that's, I mean, good for him. I guess he's doing something, and it's something that I don't have to watch him do. Yeah, I probably, I don't, I, I want to, but I don't. I, I, I mean, I want to watch New Japan, not watch Cross. Okay? Just to see him, that's what's going to make you watch New Japan. No, if I was going to watch Strong, I'd watch it for uh, Rust. I've watched Strong. I think that's a, a where Rust times. is right now. I dip in and out of New Japan Strong. It's it's good. I mean, there's not really storylines. I was it's going just... to. I'd watch like actual New Japan, but yeah. like it's, I don't know. It's just not super accessible. It's accessible, but just kind like, of. Anyways, I just it's... don't feel. And I'm honestly pretty content with AEW. And if they just yep. start bringing more New Japan guys, I'm good with that. That makes sense to me. Um, so I guess it's official. Cody Rhodes has signed with WWE, according to Mike Johnson, a PW Insider. Ooh. I saw. And he did note that the current plan is to have Rhodes debut during WrestleMania weekend. And as reported earlier, it kind of looks like Rhodes Seth Rollins is the rumored match to take place at WrestleMania 38, right? Um, so, in fact, earlier this week, Dave, Dave Meltzer himself reported that the match was still listed like internally yeah. on their run sheet. 
Which, I mean, if they put that, that like we were talking about, like that's a match I'm actually interested in. One of the only ones on the card so yeah, far. Like, I've seen I'm, that I would I actually, would dare I say, excited for that. Like that could be good. So I, I don't know. I'm kind of annoyed by the will he sign or won't he sign. So it's, I guess, good to have I'm some closure. He's actually going back. Like that's. But if you think about it, this whole dragging this out is very on brand for Cody, right? Like, how can I possibly I feel like milk? It's on brand for both of them. How can I milk as much attention as possible for this very mm-hmm. simple thing mm-hmm. that everyone knows right. I'm doing? I mean, I, I doubted it. I, I mean, didn't. hopefully when he comes, he's treated like a star. I guess <laughs> I guess I was wrong because I didn't see any reason for I him to did, go I there. Either, but but I, um, I'm surprised he's going back. But yeah, Rollins Rhodes is an actual match that I would be interested in. So and they do have history. So but they can't works. possibly have him lose, right? So that means Rollins has to take another Mania loss. I would assume. Yeah. Because you can't have Rhodes lose. I wouldn't think. He won't allow it. They won't allow it. I honestly can't see Cody Rhodes being happy in WWE for long because they might give him an initial push right out of the gate because of all the hype. But then as soon as that dies down, he's still Cody Rhodes, right? He's still what they had before that they didn't want. So I I don't know what he thinks is other than maybe he doesn't care because of the amount of money on the check. But I'm almost um, getting to the point where I'm not sarcastic. I really want to see Stardust. You're that you're the only one probably. Exactly. Um so make it fun here. <laughs> anything else from you? Um so we we talked about it a bit last week because we were recording as it happened, but I felt the need to put it in again. Um so Pete Dunn did get moved up to SmackDown, which is sad enough, but he's also aligned with Ridge Holland Sheamus, which is sadder, but could make sense because you know Pete Dunn was aligned with Holland before, right? But no, no, no. Pete Dunn is no more because he is now Butch. Yep. Woohoo. So terrible name. It's been I haven't heard anybody positive about it in my tour of wrestling media over the week. It's been completely negative. This is insane. This guy is a known quantity as Pete Dunn. I get it, you want control of his name. But do a better job of picking one then. I mean, <laughs> it's not that hard. I'm not gonna make yeah. any suggestions, but I don't think Butch is on anybody's like short list of amazing names well, for a wrestler. They just totally just stripped him of Pete Dunne. He's yeah. not—he's not cool anymore. And it's them admitting NXT UK and NXT are meaningless and don't yeah. count for anything. The few people that actually watch it, we don't care. We'll just mm-hmm. rebrand them, and you'll deal with it. And um, segueing into another bad thing that they're doing with someone really, really good. Yeah. Um, I don't know Shayna where you're going. Baszler and oh. Natalia. Shayna Baszler is teaming with Natalia. Obviously. Um, they are added to the women's tag title match at Mania 38, so now it's a four-way um, pitting them against Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley, Sasha Banks and Naomi, and the champs, Queens, Lena, and Carmella. Do are there care. any real teams in there? Hell no. No. Um, poor Shayna. I say release Baszler, release Dunn, and we're good. Yeah, that's... um. I, I that doesn't add that to the list of that matches. Is, I don't care about that it. That's brutal though. For Mania. For Shayna, like what the how she went from Nia Jax to Natalia. Like yep. that's just brutal. And she should be a single star. She's the number one person I would move to AEW. I've right. said Where that a million the hell times. Is the singles push? Like Yeah. No, she's not getting one there. Yeah, I know. Like it's so stupid. Um the what else do I have here? The Briscoes versus F T R has officially been announced for ROH Supercard of Honor. Is it for any titles or no? I would think it probably is, and I, I mean, it should be a really good match. Um, and that was kind of my thought, right? Because AEW was another story there. They have no interest in signing the Briscoes due to their um, homophobia and general intolerance, which I have no problem with AEW making that decision. Um, and I wonder if that's a way of getting the tag titles off of the Briscoes, right? Because um, they are the ROH champs right now, I want to say. Are they? I thought it was like... Aren't they? Is it still OGK? Know. Remember it was I don't them. think so. Let me... I'm trying to find the match card. I thought it was the Briscoes ended up with it, but I could be wrong. I have no idea. Because then me. I was thinking that's a way for them to get it off of and onto it. Yeah, AEW. no, they have it. It's for right. the titles. Yeah, okay. So that'll, that, in theory, I would think FTR wins. And, and that creates something interesting because then I could see... FTR doing some really nice heel work, like holding the titles and mocking the and, company. And that's a way for them the to get time. spotlight, too, because right. I don't think they're getting it at the AEW right. belt anytime soon. And again. they could sort of trash the history of the company and brag that they're elevating it finally and stuff like that, right? I feel or like that they could they're do like, it. Brand, bring it back to like the old days right. or something. So, um, yeah, they could do something cool with that, but the match itself should be pretty good. There's a lot of AEW talent that could like benefit from like for getting sure. like a temporary permanent stay in ROH, you know what I mean? Like, yep. Like they're just they're maybe they're there for like a year or something. And there's you know so many I mean? good tag teams that need something to do. So if yeah. they can duck over to Ring of Honor and whatever I think their FTR TV would looks be like, a great place to start. Yep. like that would be 
the team that you'd want there for sure. Yep. And also Taylor Rust. Of course. Um, so Sami Zayn versus Johnny Knoxville has been changed to an anything goes match, which I'm assuming will provoke interference from other jackass people. It certainly doesn't make me any more interested in celebrity not. matches. Yay. Yeah. Because that's what I want to see. I actually do. I'm just I, I, I know we'll watch WrestleMania, but we will. why? I don't know Entrance why. Stage. I don't really. Well, we okay. could Rose Rollins. turn it on for five minutes and then see the entrance stage and turn it off. I uh, don't know. I guess we'll watch it. But anyways. No, I'm um, going to watch it to complain about it. My last news story this week is um, Tony Khan sort of does intend to have AEW cross over with the new Ring of Honor TV product. Nice. In an interview with Sirius FM's Busted Open Show, Khan said regarding Ring of Honor, quote, am I going to be able to take everybody from AEW and bring them there? No. But I think there is a very cool way to use some of the great wrestlers in AEW who are going to be available and make this a great show. So I am sort of intrigued by, first of all, his purchase of Ring of Honor and what it's going to look like when it reemerges. if it turns out good, I would like, I would like to review that. Like, if it's good, I'll, I would review it weekly yeah, as well. Yeah, we could I'm add saying. that instead of UK or mix it up, yeah. whatever, go back and forth. Um, and because they have no contracted uh, wrestlers right now, it's going to probably rely pretty heavily on AEW. So... I mean, I'd been watching and reviewing the most recent Ring of Honor, and it had kind of grown stale for me and kind of uninspired by the end. Um, not the roster's fault. They have a lot of talent. It was just more the way things were being presented. So AEW's involvement has definitely sort of piqued my interest a little bit. I, I feel like they need more than a one-hour program a week, and maybe they will. I've heard no announcements on what the TV is going to look like, but... Um, I think more than one hour would be helpful for them. But, I mean, there's time for more details to come out. So we'll see. Maybe it will be. But yeah, yeah, maybe they need more of a rustic look. Ah. Oh, nobody loves, no, nobody promotes Tyler Rust more than this podcast. Yeah. So we, I assume Tyler Rust is listening. Most professional wrestlers are, right? Mm -hmm. I would. <laughs> yes. Why wouldn't they be? E two guys with e two sick we dudes at the kitchen table talking about wrestling for a couple hours. And mm -hmm. I would assume we are like a hit with wrestlers. E everyone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have any more news? I am done. Um, so on the same show that Butch was introduced last week, um, Big E Feel free to call him Pete neck. Dunn. I, I'm sticking with Walter, and I'll probably stick no, with I'm Pete No, I'm going to stick with Pete Dunn. But uh, just that Butch was introduced last week. Big E also like, broke his neck. He yeah, got belly to belly on the outside and just totally took a hit on the head. Really sad, but best case scenario, he did break a couple vertebrae, I guess it is, yeah. but no surgery necessary. And the update so. is he's already back on his feet. Good. So that's good for him. Um, and apparently just a positive guy the whole time. Like, you broke your neck and he kind of stayed positive about it, which is very much what Big E is, from what I understand. So really sucks to see that happen to him. But I guess considering it's pretty much best case scenario. I saw some, like, career end talk, which, I mean, I hope not. I don't, I don't think so, because I feel like guys like Brian and Edge came back, right? So I feel like he'll be, he should be okay. It just might be a while. And when he comes back, um, the silver lining is... Sometimes you come back as a, just a mega huge baby face, right? Especially when it's something really serious that everybody watched. Well, and everyone loved him already. And it looked awful, right? We watched the the suplex. Um, feel bad for Ridge Holland too. Like, sure, I'm not a fan of him, but I can't I'm imagine being responsible for breaking somebody's neck. You yeah, must feel pretty bad. Sure. But anyways, I'm glad Big E looks like he's going to be okay. Hopefully his career will continue. How are how do they not push him when he comes back? They have to. Uh, I think you have to at that point, like, right? He's going to get a hero's welcome sort of thing so i think they're they're right this is their chance to redeem it if hopefully they're smart at all well so at, no at all so no <laughs> oh, so no chance yeah, so like right. two percent chance um i'm done so, so apparently wait. austin is reportedly set to close out night one of mania whether it's the match or segment with owens it better not be a match i don't i don't have any interest you, in any you want of it. a segment main eventing night one of mania well, i don't then. I like, couldn't, I, I'm not sure I could actually care less about WrestleMania at this point, so I don't care what they do. I'm going to be half paying attention anyways at best. It's just like... Because I'm angry they're not offering anything that... Is on WrestleMania. Right, like, like because we're... Worth, hard, worthy, I mean. Because we're hardcore wrestling fans, we're not interested in the celebrities crossing over. Um, because they don't know how to build anyone or do anything, I'm not really interested. Other than, like, going, okay, in ring... That should be good, right? With Rollins Rhodes. There's nothing. But like since they're holding off on Cody, there's not really much of a build for it. And him. I'm interested in, in Reigns Lesnar as well. Just again, the in-ring should be interesting yeah, for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little interested in that, but I'm 
most of me is just like, really, we're doing that again? But no stories have been interesting. No builds have caught my eye. I'm, it's just kind of there this year, more than ever. Yeah. Um, but yeah. anyways. Um, last one is an update on the AW console game that it'll have a story mode. That's good. Yeah. The more yeah. features, the better. It's I been assume. in development for a while, but I'm just I'm trusting that they're just figuring out. It'll. I'm hoping it'll be good. Um, hopefully by then I can play it on next gen. Right. Awesome. All right. Well, I guess that wraps up news and rumors. Shall we move into talking about some actual wrestling and looking at this week's episode of AEW Dynamite? Um, so first we open with Undisputed Era versus Hangman and Jurassic Express. I love your voice right now. Thanks. <laughs> I hope the listeners are good with it. Yeah, I, I'd hope so, but I won't <laughs> Forgive have to us. hear it. So no, it's on them and, and on it is, you. It, I'm, and I'm not trying to be mean, but it is significantly improved. Like if you had recorded yesterday. two days ago or yeah. yesterday, I was kind of like, but maybe we, you know, maybe yeah, I'll just... yeah, yeah. No, I, I would have obliged too. Yeah, like, <laughs> it, it wasn't great, but it's it's still it's it's still pretty this awesome. This is doable. Um, it, so yeah. Uh, notables, uh, there's a back and forth between Cole and Jungle Boy before Jungle Boy gets a better Cole and finishes with a Hurricane Rana. They did have a match, right? Who? Um, Cole and Jungle Boy. They definitely did. I don't remember how they set that up, but I know they had a match. They did. I remember it as well. It was one of the first things Cole did, I want to say. That's what I was thinking, right? right? I don't remember why, but I remember they did it. Um, so then Undisputed Air are targeting Lot like a Luchasaurus in the corner. Um, there's a hot tag player by Hangman. He's just like running all over the place, diving on to them, and then Cole signing Fish out of the ring and then diving on to Cole and O'Reilly again. Um, there's a pop-up set of Powerbomb to Fish for two. Um, there's simultaneous moonsaults from all three baby faces, so Hangman does like his signature Orihara moonsault to Cole. Moon turnbuckles on um, Luchasaurus, it's an apron moonsault to Kyle O'Reilly. And then Jungle Boy does an in-ring moonsault to Fish for two count. Uh, hot tag flurry from Luchasaurus post-commercial break. Um, I think he hit all the kicks and stuff. All the kicks. <laughs> Uh, Cole <laughs> catches a dive from Jungle Boy with a super kick, which looked pretty nice, and Kyle Riley puts Luchasaurus in a heel hook. Cole puts Hangman in a guillotine to block him out, but then Hangman uses Cole to break the submission on Luchasaurus. Um, there was like Cole or Hangman and Luchasaurus hold. I think it was like Cole and someone else uh, for a double doomsday device with Jungle Boy. Yes. And then Cole blind tags later on and hits a last shot to score the win for Undisputed Era. Yeah, man, this um, this match was a lot of fun. I thought, and sorry, just my research looks like his first singles match was against Jungle Boy on All September right. 29th, possibly. That makes sense. Uh, but anyway, sorry, I thought this was a very fun match. I thought Jungle Boy and Cole um started it out really strong, and they seem to have really good chemistry. Although that seems to be the case with Jungle Boy, right? Like I'm pretty much like anyone he's in there with. Um. I thought there were really nice hot tag to Paige that the crowd was really invested in. Really good crowd was, tonight for like, this show. zooming all over the place. Yeah, the triple moonsault was a fun spot, and the crowd really loved that as well. Um, and then just Red Dragon strength, right? Is their really quick, strong-looking combination offense. They got a nice chance to I, showcase I really that. Them, yeah. The Luchasaurus hot tag everybody always wants was there. Um, Jungle Boy, yes, jumping into that cool super kick looked really good. The Doomsday device was nice, so... Um, I, an excellent match, great opener to the show. Everybody got a chance to look good here. I thought Cole getting to pick up the pinfall to earn a little back from losing to Paige makes sense too, right? He hits his finisher on a pillar of the company in Jungle Boy <laughs> right. and pins him clean. So I think that's a good little rebound for, um, Cole. And uh, this wasted no time, right? This was pretty much action from start to finish, like perfect time, like 14 minutes, which I really liked. Um, and it kind of reminded me of the type of matches that were opening Dynamite pretty regularly at one point, right? It seemed like every week it was a trios or an eight-man or something that was just craziness. So I just thought a really fun start to the show. I liked it a lot. And you, as you are <laughs> wiping your nose. There we go. Um, yeah, I think it was a perfect choice for the opener. Um, if we didn't have the key match, I think it was suited as a main event too, like they did um, with um, Hangman of Dark Order mm -hmm. versus Undisputed Era when they were in uh, Daly's place, I think it was. Right. Um, but I like this as it almost takes you back to those um, multi-man tags that always open the show. Um, some of the spots or sequences were cool. I liked Hangman's hot tag a lot because it felt like a really hot tag. Like it was He was good, just yeah. running all over the place. 
Um, stuff like the triple the triple moon salt and the double doomsday device were pretty cool. I felt like uh, Unspeeder didn't get like a lot of huge spots aside from the cool super kick, but like they took a more the grounder approach targeting Luchasaurus, so I thought that was cool. Like you said, Red Dragon's offense is always really cool. Um, I like that they got the win though. Um, sucks strong away to take the pin, but I think it works the best out of the three on that team. Um, I hope it does set up the Cole Hangman rematch, which I assume it does. Um, which, but we'll see. I think so. All around a good opener, I thought. Um, Me too. And next we move to a Keith Lee Team Taz segment. Yeah, because Keith Lee can't get away from this somehow. Yeah, Every anyways. week it's this, but anyways. Yeah, um, so Keith Lee will face Max Caster on Rampage because he's a member of Team Taz. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, apparently, so they... Like the acclaimed and Team Taz attacked him after the match on Rampage, and Swerve uh, made the save. So Swerve Keith Lee have a affiliation. That'd be cool. I guess. Um, well, because there was the segment later, I guess there is. Um, Stark said it's Lee's lucky day, or Lee's lucky day. Uh, he has an ass whooping saved for another day. Stark says Lee shouldn't come on his show Rampage. Like, why is it his show? Like, I don't has know. he been? Like, I guess I remember he had the match against Lethal once, but like. Um, I don't remember anything else. It's Hook Show. We all know that anyways. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Team Taz Show, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's why they attacked him last week. If he shows up again, they'll do it again. Lee asked if they me last week when he punched Starks and he laid on the ground. And he says he'll see them Friday. Yeah, I don't know. It's a fine interaction. But again, it's just Keith Lee toiling at the low level on this card for some reason. And starks is fine on the mic but again they talk tough and don't really accomplish anything i would like right? starks so, versus swerve though that'd be cool it's my complaint that i had about violent by design and impact right they cut these really good promos and cool stuff and they sound really tough and then they never win so it kind of just i don't know and it's this odd choice to never let keith lee speak right like he's just interrupted by starks week after week after week so i'm not sure what that happened to was it like jungle boy or something I can't remember. I think like I feel like that happened to a bunch before. But I, I don't I don't know. I, I can't imagine Keith Lee's happy with his positioning so far, but I guess we'll see. It just seems like more of the same, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I understand if they don't have much for Lee. I'm fine with him having like filler matches against guys like Caster, like building him on rampage. That that's fine. I just don't think they need to also have this meaningless team Taz feud. Because right, like, like it feels like a huge waste you're of time. Building him to take on Team Taz, like that doesn't seem necessary right. to me. But yeah, anyways. I don't mind these build matches and then like if you're going to have him feud with mid-card guys, pick better ones. Right. Um, Like, he could brief feud with the Acclaimed even. That would be all right. Yep. Or something like I feel like there's a lot you could do that's better than Team Taz. I agree. Um, Next, we got, like, a really quick Statlander package, which was just, like, it, the music kind of, like, slows down, like, in a horror movie or whatever. Or, like, in the Fiends theme. You yep. know how it does that. And then she's, like, washing off her paint. And pulling the jewels off her face and stuff. So, yeah. I... I at this point, I was quite, you and I were both kind of like, ooh, a gimmick change probably. But yes, I've seen now a picture sort of leaked of her new look. It looks cool. It's She's definitely darker. Page, I think. Um, it's definitely like a darker look. So Statlander Oscuro. This w- yeah, basically. Kind of looked more like um, Rhea Ripley kind of style, I guess, yeah. is what I would say. Um, but at the point of seeing this, it was a nice little teaser, right? It was just really quick way of saying, hey, she's going to which we have kind of wanted a gimmick change, right? Like the whole like alien thing is how she started. And then they just kind of ignored that. And then it was just, she boops people and then it was kind of nothing. Right. So I think a gimmick change is a good attempt for her if it, if it can work. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, not much here, but I just heard that there was speculation of a gimmick change, which yep, I've seen pictures would be in her best interest. I think, I think so too. <clears throat> Um, next we get John Moxley and Brian Danielson versus the best friends, which is not Chuck Taylor, Trent Beretta, it's Yuta. Well, it has to be Yuta because he's one of the ones they specifically I guess. called but out to join it, them, right? Make it Yuta and Trent Beretta. Because they called out him, Moriarty, and Garcia, I think, as potential, like... Uh, I just want Trent Beretta. I know you do, but I'm explaining why it's not Trent Beretta. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he saw it in somewhat competitive TV tag, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, Mox and Danison once like once again attacked them like right away, which right I as did. the bell rings, they which did I liked last week too. Yep, it was last week, right? They're the super aggressive, violent tag team, and I like it a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, um, there's knees to the head, and then a snapmare, and a kick to the back of Yuta by Mox, uh, forearms and chops to Danielson by Chuck Taylor off of a hot tag. Uh, Taylor's dancing in a half crowd, but he tags out to Mox mid submission. He kicks Taylor off. 
Uh, Superplex by Mox for two. Uh, hot take flurry by Yuta, but some of the offense looked kind of weak in my opinion. It oh, yeah? just didn't look super impactful. Mm-hmm. Um, there was like a hard attack like move by uh, Mox and Bryant, but uh, Chuck Taylor breaks the pin. Uh, paradigm shift Chuck on the outside. Uh, yes kicks by Brian, but uh, Yuta ducks the roundhouse. Um, Yuta fights against them, but takes a German suplex from Mox and Regal Plex, which was like that shoulder capture suplex. I like it. Yeah. Uh, by Danielson for two. Um, and then the finish comes when Brian hits the wrist trap, stops, and then Box comes in with the bulldog choke to choke out Yuta. And then after the match, Yuta comes back in the ring and offers a handshake to Regal, like maybe joining them. Right. And Regal slaps Yuta. He glares back at Regal, and then Regal's like nodding at him and says some stuff that I didn't catch, and then Yuta leaves. Uh, he basically, you asked me what he said at the time, like, you better go before it gets to something. I can't remember what it was. And I think the idea is, like, the slap across the face is kind of like a handshake to them because they're, like, violent, whatever, right? So it's kind of them initiating him into the group, possibly. So but I think, then he leaves? like Yeah, so they left it a little bit open-ended. But I think the idea is that um, it's great for wheeler yuda to have these friends but that they're not helping him become the best wrestler he could be right and that he needs to learn the viciousness of mox and danielson to get to that next level which i kind of like that simple story um and yuda like we said was one of the talent danielson called out specifically so this was yet like another lesson for him in an attempt to have him join mox danielson and regal which i hope he kind of does i like that idea so I appreciate the story behind this. I thought this was another good tag team match, right? Yuta got a little bit of a chance to shine here. I thought he looked pretty good um, before he got made sort of an example of. Um, and I don't know. I'm just hoping that this like ultra violent. It's funny because they're both this combination of technical ability, but aggression and violence, right? That that Danielson perfectly personifies for me. So I hope that this faction does grow um, with the young guys they've mentioned would be good because I think they could probably help them in real life and on the show. So I, I was fine with this match. I thought it was good. Yeah, for sure. I thought it was another cool enhanced match for Mox and Danielson, another violent one. I liked last week's better, but I think this was still good. Mm-hmm. Um, many stiff strikes again. Um, I'd like to say I think Yuta is kind of a mixed bag for me because I think so his offense look kind of weak and not impactful here. I feel like this is the only time, but I think generally he's pretty good talent because he's pretty like pretty good technician and can go with like strikes and whatnot, but... I think some of his offense looked kind of soft, like the drop kick and then the inverted atomic drop and the Instagram. He didn't look his best, I think. Right. Off of the hot tag. Um, but generally, I think it was another good one. They killed Yuta in the finish, but that was good. Um, I like the part after. I'm not sure where that's leaning, but um, seems cool. Um, and then we get an FTR interview because obviously they fired Tully last week. Um, Cash says firing Tully didn't come easy, but they have been talking about it for a while and they think Tully checked out because. When he won the titles, he was laser focused, but he, he's been like off the ball lately or something. Yeah, he basically yeah hasn't been as invested or on point or whatever as he was right. in the beginning. Um, Dax is there a few people who respect Tully more than they do, and he says something else. But the young bucks come in for yep. some reason. Um, Matt says they can hire the best manager in the world, but it won't make a difference. He says they should also hire a new stylist, and they'll always be the second best tag team in AEW, and then they leave. Um, I thought it was fine. I was pretty sure. I thought Cash was good because i thought what he said made sense um i thought that was pretty good and the bucks coming in was kind of random and i guess we're maybe getting a bucks ftr rematch like that seems kind of random but I'll or, take it. or it could be aew does like i always call it the breadcrumbs right so they yeah. put that out there now and maybe it doesn't pay off for six weeks eight weeks could be they have a match next week you never really know right which i kind of like just because people in groups interact doesn't necessarily mean they're going to quickly have a match but they could um and i'd be okay with it still so i like the um, heel ftr like subtly blaming their manager for their problem right that kind of makes sense um and they made a a bret hart reference here right so the rumor i think they said something the best there is um and there is rumor of bret possibly showing up at some point in support of ftr so i don't know if that's them dropping a hint towards that and he's got aw history yeah the the bucks uh ftr did seem kind of random but i'm okay if they want to bring that back around um because they're kind of, it could be a distraction as they wait for all of the Adam Cole drama to sort of unravel, I right? I still remember the finish to their match. That was really good. Yeah. Um, so they would have excellent matches anytime. So it was, this was a pretty quick segment and it suggested a new direction that would create some more great matches. So I'm fine with 
people and teams having issues with multiple people in teams. We've talked about it a bunch. Like, I think that's a cool thing in AEW is that you're not just locked in with one feud. You could be sort of dabbling elsewhere. So I had no problem with this segment. Mm-hmm. Um, and then next we have a quick promo from the Acclaimed. Um, and Caster's talking about how he's going to be Keith Lee and then Starks and Hobbs come in saying you want them to take care of Leah, show these new guys how it is. And then Swerve comes in, walking in Starks saying he's going to make Friday nights. And Swerve has, I guess, taking offense to that because he's also right. a new signing. He is. Um, and all new signings have to go through Team Taz, it looks like. Did that's, anyone else do that? At um, some point. Uh, uh, that seems like it. I mean, so House of Black versus Team Taz because Murphy and, I guess, Brody Kane. Right. Um, I thought it was solid from Caster Moe's usual stuff. Team Taz, while well, it makes sense, I guess, because they also have issues with that. And then I like Swords, but here, wouldn't mind if he, if he teamed with Lee. I'd watch that. Yeah. I, I'm It'd be interesting. I thought this made Team Taz look a bit weak, right? Because Starks, if you think about it, he's basically saying, like, we need you to do what we can't do, right? We want you to take out Keith Lee because we can't, sort of thing. I guess so. Or it's like, because. <laughs> They already Sorry. have an opportunity to, so right. And I don't, I don't love Swerve being tangled up in Team Taz, also because again, this is not, this is like a bottom faction in this company, and you're this hot debut, hot free agent signing, and you're starting out right at the bottom. Like I would rather you're just squashing jobbers for a few weeks than sort of setting the example of you're in a multi-week feud with a very sort of bottom tier group. But anyways, this just seems to be something that's annoying me but anyways it's fine i guess we'll see yeah where it goes. it's all right i kind of trust Ado. and again we said it before it might just be that they have long-range plans for swerve and keith lee but they're also have other stories and things that they need to finish and deliver on that, first that's what i was because they actually yeah. do seem to have a plan unlike some other companies we know so i'll give them the benefit of the doubt right. that they will get around to these guys um pushing them when the time comes right um next we get the commencement for jazz Yep. Um, Jericho's faction of sports entertainers. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Matt Lee says that the, they love that song. The crowd does uh, Judas, and they have to thank Jericho for it. And he says if it were up to him, there would be no sing-along. And that's why Jericho's a better man than him. Yeah, that's why. Such a heel. <laughs> uh, Parker says that is why Jericho deserves to be praised and idolized for his contributions as a human and in this industry. And then he introduces Jericho. Um, Jericho says the Earth has been around for 4.5 billion years, and we are all lucky enough to be alive in the Chris Jericho era. And for the past 30 years, have been living vicariously through him. Mm-hmm. He has helped build companies such as AEW. And no Jericho, no you. So he says you're welcome. He says he should be appreciated, but no one on social media or in AEW appreciates him. He said the inner circle never did. Guevara walked away, and Proud Powerful disrespected him, and Kingston embarrassed him um, by tapping him out. Um, he says these guys do appreciate it, but that's why they are jazz, and they appreciate each other. Um, are you laughing at jazz? Yes, you just love to say jazz for some reason. Yeah, it's it's better. <laughs> and it's I'm not saying Jericho appreciates in society or J A S. Fair enough. Um, he says they are better because they are more than pro wrestlers. A, a pro wrestler, I don't like this part. A pro wrestler never became a millionaire, and he has multiple times over become one because he is much more than a pro wrestler. He is. A sports entertainer. Yeah, he is. And Garcia kind of looks bad for a second. He says, if Jericho's going to stay, they're called himself a sports entertainer. And he's a sports entertainer, too. Nope. Definitely not. Yeah, that. I like, and they are sports entertainers. I have no idea what Garcia and Hager are doing here. Yeah, I, that's part of my thing, too. They are, <laughs> that's my first note. Hager and Garcia are hardly sports entertainers. When has Hager ever been entertaining? That's exactly my point. <laughs> he's got the sports part down, but the entertaining, that's, not that's so true. much. That's true. Yeah. Um, uh, Jericho talks about an indie wrestler car crash and he don- mo- donated money for the recovery. One of the guys was Garcia. So that is true, him. whether he donated money or not. I heard Tony Khan donated a lot to them. But, anyways. Mm. Um, he says 2.0 r- use their real names now along with stupid nicknames. So, Matt Lee is Daddy Magic, Matt Menard, and then Cool Hang and Angelo Parker. Yeah, that's, which you were not a big fan of. That's just weird. It's not as bad it's as heel, WWE. They're heels, man. Changes, You're supposed to so. hate it. It's not as bad as WWE, so. I guess. Um, he said they appreciate him after Kevin. Ooh, his former friend Kevin. But isn't it a bit ironic that they're basically like, we're all sports entertainers, but you're going to get rid of your sports entertaining name and go with your real name? 
isn't that kind of the opposite of That's the point true. of this, right? Like you're these big sports entertainers. Wouldn't you be like, we're keeping our sports entertainment names that we got. Or making more sports entertainment. Like, yeah, or like, uh, yeah that, that is Anyways, weird if you think about it. Maybe it's on purpose. I don't know. Um, yeah. After his, uh, <laughs> after his old friend, Kevin asked them to host, um, uh, asked him to host them on Talk is Jericho. Um, and they got to talking or whatever and blah, blah, blah. Other stuff I didn't write down because Jericho was talking a lot. He was. Um, Jericho says, Hager is his ride or die. And Hager says, they're the jazz. And they beat up pro wrestlers because they are not pro wrestlers. And then Jericho says, they are the jazz. And that is entertainment, which I don't like that phrase because it feels like it's ripping off on Undisputed Era with the that is Undisputed, except this just sounds stupid. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think about it, but I guess it is kind of similar. Um. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of this either. I don't think you are. I get I'm not. I get that Jericho's leaning into the sports entertainment stuff to get heat, but I'm not a fan. It feels I think we talked about it in the moment. To me, it's really cheap heat. Like, of course it's going to work. It's like coming out and insulting the city you're in or insulting the local sports team, right? Right, we did talk about it because I saw the one clip and I, so I was curious what to, to see what you thought about it, right? So. Yeah, and I was, it reminds me of like when Cena was early heel and he would come out in the sports jersey of that town's nemesis, right? To get heat. Or I think MJ so, still does, like he always goes for that, right? But like, I think he does it well. He does. And you know that, and that's part of what he does, right? But, and you know that this crowd hates wwe and hates the idea of sports entertainment so it really just feels like um cheap heat and low-hanging fruit for jericho like of course it's gonna work um but i don't think it's very creative or clever for a guy who's known for sort of reinventing himself all the time right like you're basically just gonna come out and say i hate this city every week um it's just the only difference is you're going i'm a sports entertain you know the crowd doesn't want it it just seems very easy, right? And I'm, and maybe it's going to work really yeah. well. And I think Jericho did a good job delivering whatever he was saying here. It just was pretty lengthy and not a message that I really wanted to hear. The 2.0 name change is kind of whatever and really was just tacked on there. Um, and yeah, clearly a couple of these guys aren't sports entertainers. I don't know if that's they know that and that's supposed to be funny slash interesting, whatever. I, I, I don't know. I'm just... I feel like this is a pretty lazy gimmick to go with um to get heat so that's kind of how i feel about it yeah um i did not like this i think generally the deliver delivery was solid or fine with jericho and 2.0 but i did not like it um i don't like them leaning into the pro wrestler sports entertainer terms it's really annoying because it's like it's kind of like um when lambert is exposing the business but like more so it's just like nobody else is talking like that or talking about that right it's just kind of like ignored like you yeah. just don't need to like that's just like comparing AEW and WWE like like you just don't need to do that it's just like it'd be like you I can don't just know, present like, a characters diff- in a tv show like talking about like how they're like this kind of actor or something right. or like they're, they're in like a genre you can like, just present a product that's different you don't have to smash us over the head with that fact right, right. like just do your thing and stay in your lane and don't worry so much yeah, about it's just weird to say like oh all these guys are just pro wrestlers and they're not like they don't have much right. of a gimmick or like they just wrestle or like whatever and like jericho's like the whole package of sports entertainer like right it's ridiculous um and like you said it's all just like this easy tp2 um which is like and like because of course the aw fans are gonna like this and all and like why anyone watching this would like it i certainly don't and cheapy does work sometimes like i think mjf does it really well but um i think this it like you said it being the entire stick is right. just really like cheap it's like jericho's great at reinventing himself but i think this is a miss because like i think it's just like he could do better than this yeah I feel with like. mjf it's like one of the arrows in his quiver sort of thing right whereas right. this feels like this is pretty much this jericho's thing right? right so yeah mm-hmm. i don't know we'll see where it goes and like i don't mind him having a new faction but i don't think this needs to be what it's centered around no and i respect jericho like again trying to change his character and trying yeah. to reinvent himself a bit but for me so far this one isn't working it's kind of like i didn't really like the pain maker i don't think that one was a very good character either but i guess it served its purpose so they can't all be you know amazing gimmicks i guess but yeah can't not a fan be, of this so far can't always be a le champion that's right that one was good right um, next we got a quick D promo with like a package kind of spliced in. Um, I didn't really catch it, but she was just cutting a promo about how like 
it was like Kushida said like that when she was in Japan, Deep was all she thought about, and like the Deep didn't think about her at all. I, I quite like that. I, that was one of the lines I liked. Um, there's just highlights twice to go too. I didn't catch much of it, but you should check it out if you can find it. Um, I thought it was a solid promo. I just like how she progressively starts to kind of like flip out. Me too. I like that line that I mentioned. Um, and I think it was solid. I, I think it builds that final grudge match, which would be really cool. Let's do an Iron Man match or Iron Woman match. I yep. guess that'd be sick. They could. I really like Deeb here, and I have to admit, early on, I was <laughs> not sure she could be a heel. I've just completely misjudged Deeb from the beginning. She is fantastic. I've mentioned it before. Crazy how she went from like compare this to her what she was in WWE. I right, think it's crazy. And I, she's looking super shredded too, right? Like crazy ripped in this little promo, but. Yeah, I I really liked that it was like, oh, so you were in Japan just obsessing over me. Well, I didn't really think about you at all. Like, I think that's just an easy, yeah, she's just doing rookie strong chances. heel thing to do. So she's really leaning into this heel role, doing a great job. And this feud's been going on forever. And I'm so far not sick of it, right? It seems like um they take a step back from it for a bit and then they bring it back kind of th- Again, they don't have enough women on their show, in my opinion. But um, I thought this was a good use of a little bit of time for the Deeb cheetah um, feud that i am still here for Sorry. i think it would have been cool if they had like a the match on the show because then they would have had like two women's matches which would have been something right they and don't two usually do two women's yeah. matches between that are prominent really good performers who have some story going on right so yeah that would have made sense to me too mm-hmm. but um yeah i like the little video mm-hmm. um so next we get scorpio sky versus wardlow for the tnt title and so, because there's an extra TNT title belt, um, Dan Lambert's it wearing it. made me laugh. I'm not going to lie. Dan Lambert, at whatever age he is and whatever shape he's in, wearing the the T, what is it, the, the TNT interim belt? The TNT title, I guess. I, uh, it made me laugh. Yeah. Not going to lie. I mean, if Sky doesn't want to carry around the two, that's a funny way to use it for sure. Um, in my description of this, fine. Um, <laughs> there was corners. Even a special analysis right there, <laughs> fine. It was fine. Um, corner strikes from Sky and he bites Wardlow's head until he has to release for the five count. Uh, Wardlow has an exchange with Van Zandt's husband, insert name of this MMA guy here. Yep, don't and, know. And goes to powerbomb him, but Sky hits a basement dropkick to knock Wardlow off. There's some belly to belly overhead tosses by Wardlow. No necks were broken in the execution of these belly to belly. Um, one handed spine buster by Wardlow. Powerbombs by Wardlow, three, but Lambert distracts and Wardlow goes for a fourth. And Sky rolls out of the ring. Wardlow goes for a power bomb on the outside, but Spears shows up on the ramp with two chairs. Ooh. Ooh. Um, while Spears is causing a distraction, MJ comes in and shoves Wardlow into the ring post. And um, he rolls in the ring and gets rolled up by Sky for the win, which I thought was weird because, like, you know how many times people get rammed into ring posts? Yes. Like, a lot. Come on, MJF, do better. All the time. Um, that MMA guy, uh, insert name here, mm-hmm. uh, beats up Wardlow. Sky holds Wardlow for a chair shot, but he starts to fight back. MJ tries to flee, but Wardlow stops him, goes for a power bomb, but then Spears attacks with a chair, and MMA guy locks in a sleeper <laughs> choke. Uh, chair shot to the head by Spears. He did cover up, thankfully. Like, yes. Which, again, like I think that's more realistic. If you're not covering up, Like you just it's like you want to get hit. Your instinct head. would be to cover up, right, if someone right. actually swinging a chair right. at you. Um, MJ pays off Lambert and then hits a ring shot to Wardlow. Yeah, um... I don't know, man. The match itself, I didn't think was great just because of all the distractions and interference. I think it was one of those things that was more about getting to the angle that followed. Um, and I guess it mostly made sense to me. Wardlow looked strong here. Scorpio Sky and his cronies are underhanded heels, so they played that role fine. Um, and I guess there was, in fact, as they're saying, right, long range planning for Scorpio Sky to hold this title. It makes sense that he hangs on to the belt here. In addition, Wardlow has left a faction to go solo, right? So that kind of makes sense that that came back to bite him here as well, the numbers game. Yeah, as we were kind of thinking would happen, right? So I'm I'm glad they did execute that. Yeah, and he doesn't... He has sort of bigger fish to fry in MJF right now, so he doesn't need a belt. That feud does not need any sort of championship involved, right? So um, I'm happy that Sky doesn't just be a really, like, footnote um, transitional champion sort of thing, that he is getting a bit of a run. I I really didn't think that was AEW's kind of thing, right? I don't think they would, A do that ever be like plan for sky to win the title just to do that right and mjf paying people i mean it's really easy and convenient but it does make sense it's consistent with what he would do so there i think um the match itself was kind of not really the point of this i guess so it's just the numbers game idea wardlow's on his own and nobody's there to help him and 
he's going to, I guess, spin out of this and take on Mi- uh, Miz. Why do I call wow. him that sometimes? Well, they are he, kind of similar. Right, but he's much better, I think. But anyways, much better, especially um, now. Like, I think 2016 yes. was good. But... So he's spinning off into facing MJF. So, uh, yeah, this was, this was fine. I, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's my <laughs> in-depth analysis. It was fine. It was fine. Mm-hmm. As a match, this was fine. Right. Um, it was okay, just nothing spectacular. Sky didn't do much, but got it a bit, I guess. Didn't catch much from more, though, before he went trigger happy, went again with the power bombs. Um, MJF interference I saw coming, but made sense. Allowed Sky to get the win, so I'm fine with it. Um, match was fine, just not a lot to it, but it, it was more so to accomplish everything else, it was, right? So it, sure. it made sense. Yep. Uh, the aftermath was just an assault on more, though, but that was solid. Uh, makes more sense when you see MJF paying them off, which is just an easy thing to do, but like, I think it adds a bit. It just fits, right? Of it makes ties sense. that together. Yep. Um, does make me more interested to see what MJF will say next week. It's, and then it's at least not like MJF's just randomly working with American Top Team to beat up some big guy. I guess American Top Team don't pay their people very well. They're taking side jobs, right? From, <laughs> from wrestlers out here. I think he even paid Lambert, too. So I guess it's an indictment was... against Lambert and his whole organization, I think, basically. True. <laughs> um, maybe they just get paid fine. Just fine. Yeah. Always, I guess the argument is you could always take more money, even if you're paid a ton. Why not make more? I guess That's true. corporate greed, <laughs> especially Lambert. I guess, yeah. yeah. Um, next we get a quick Cargill promo. Um, Sterling asks who's ready to be lucky number 30. Cargill says she's done with this and asks who's ready to step up. Don't you feel like you they could have said this like what last week or just, the week? Don't before? you feel like you could have basically gone back to almost the first ever Jade and Mark Sterling thing and just copy and pasted it for like just. 15 weeks straight right and just maybe modify it to be like number 30 and and i'm not even saying i hate it but they're jet je- they're definitely stuck in a rut it's like inching her along though right i think it's just like trying to protect her and keeping everything to the formula they've de- devised for her like you're gonna say one line at the end of every promo sterling's gonna say the rest and then Better you're gonna when have wagner does it <laughs> and then you're gonna have like quick little matches where you dominate and i think they're just sort of that's the routine right now it doesn't because i guess they're so short it doesn't really bother me but they're pretty much the same all the time yeah. if they were mm-hmm. if they were any longer i'd be annoyed but they're just kind of there yeah. for me right so it's oh, yeah, fine. that reminds me how's my buddy von wagner doing he was not on nxt this week that's good that's right good. so it was uh, made the episode a little better, I guess, but oh, it definitely still did. wasn't good. We'll get there. Don't worry. <laughs> Wait, what? I know. Shocking to hear yeah. that it wasn't good. Speaking of something I didn't like, mm-hmm. um, next we get the Hardys versus Private Party, and Jeff does have face paint, so now he has minimal purpose here. And it is 2022, and we are getting the Hardy Boys. Yep. Just thought That's... I'd point that out. Yeah. It is. Thank you for pointing out <laughs> that nope. sad fact. No problem. Um. The rest of his gear from the neck down is identical, ironically, to his last WWE Elite figure with like nice. the teal um, sleeves and like the teal and yellow belt. The face paint has the same colors, it's just a different design. I right. Think. But I think that's funny. Like he basically just used a WWE look and changed the face paint a bit. Nice. At so, least you got your face paint. That's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's about. No, I mean, go ahead. It, it, talk about the match. Yeah. It's fine. Um, here's my description. The same as any Hardy Boys match you've ever seen, except different components to make it slightly different. But I mean, that's a little bit complimentary, considering if they're now 40, mid to late 40s doing the same stuff they did in their 20s, right? It is not. I think you kind of just gave them a compliment. It is not. No? Because they do the same offense every match. I know, but the fact that if at 45, let's say you're doing the same stuff you did at 22. Okay, fine. It was slightly worse than the matches when they were young. As a 45-year-old human being, that's not a bad thing. But anyways, go ahead. Okay, it was was like their other matches except they're older, so it was a little worse. (laughs) I have to make it not complimentary. I refuse to make any sort of complimentary (laughs) gesture towards the Hardy Boys is your stance. Go, Go ahead. Um, so Quinn gives Matt a thumbs down again and Matt attacks him with forearms. Jeff tags in, they do one of their classic moves where like they slam him like I think it was a hip toss or something, like Matt does like the stand in leg drop or elbow, I don't remember yeah. what it was, and Jeff does this little flippy thing. Yes. Um, so yeah. And then they do poetry motion, aka the stuff they do every match because it's now it's all they know. Um, double team wheelbarrow suplex by the Hardys for two. They're giving the people what they want. How dare you? Just not us people. <laughs> Other people. Just not. Beside us. The crowd was eating it up, right? So I don't know. It's, funny, it's funny how um, 
the crowd went from hating sports entertainers to welcoming one with open arms. Yeah, one yeah. with issues. And yeah. having him do his stuff, but yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, Private Party hit a variation of that double team move the Hardys did earlier, except Quinn var- um, did a shooting star press and said what well, Jeff did, so suck it, Jeffrey. Um, there was a foot stomp uh, net breaker combo by Private Party for two. That was pretty cool. I liked it. I think Quinn came off the top rope with the stomp it was. Um, yep. Matt counters Private Party's attempt at poetry in motion by hitting a side effect to Cassidy onto Quinn's back. Um, and then Jeff Hardy um, gets a hot tag. He just does most of his usual, usual crap. If you've seen Jeff Hardy wrestle before, you I know have. what he did. Um, side effect to Quinn and another to Cassidy by Matt. And Matt and Jeff also the top rope splash for two, which is why the match did not end there. Um, later on, there's simultaneous twist of fates, followed by a swanton bomb from Jeff for the win. After Shocking. the match, the AFO come out. The AFO now. Or AFO. AFO. Sorry, AFO. They are AFO. We got Jazz. They are AFO. They <laughs> are pretty AFO. I gotta, if I'm calling them Jazz, I gotta go with AFO, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so they stare on the ring, and Derby and Sting come out to make the save, because, oh my god, it's a 60-year-old guy. They all back down immediately. Exactly. Well, that seems to be the thing. You got to. I think that's the reason nobody should take Team Taz or AFO seriously. Because they are lower card map factions and they have to run away from Sting. They do. And AFO do back off. Um, this was exactly what you would expect. Maybe a bit longer than it needed to be. I was kind of hoping Private Party was going to work a bit more heel because I told you I saw Quen on... Who is he facing? Oh, Darby, Darby Allen. On. And I thought he was really good and he was a heel and he worked really slow. And anyways, they did not. So I, I'm going to be honest, the Hardys look good in this, but no. it's, it's not really the point for me. Um, I have seen more than enough of the Hardys in my lifetime. I've been watching wrestling for over 30 years, right? So I saw them in their infancy, saw their whole career. I was a big fan of them at one point uh, early on specifically. Like TLC. But like one of the main things I love about AEW is the freshness. It's performers I haven't already watched for years in combinations that I haven't seen a million or times. Or it's like if it's like someone like Danielson, it's like a style you have And he's seen different, him, right? right? He's like, been sort of unleashed and he's, exactly. he's working a different right, style. Different style. Like I feel like Hardy's, even though it is AEW, they're still going to, like that's the thing. They're going to do the same style. And if you had like substitute this for like, you're going to bring the Hardys in for one match at a pay-per-view and you build, I might have even been a little bit interested in it, right? Um, but knowing that they're here and that they're just taking up spots from like this roster has so many tag teams that I would rather see at this point, and I know it's not for me. Or like the crowd. if we're even going on TV time, like we were just talking about how much the women get on right. a weekly basis, and now like sometimes you're gonna throw in the Hardys. Like I right. feel like it's just like taking up a spot from tag teams or other people that deserve exactly. it more. There's other people that like that haven't had years. My of motivation is to see things I haven't seen a million times, and I know that the general crowd is reacting really well to this, and they're not tailoring their the stuff just for me. Well, Sting. Um, but so I don't know. I don't need them on the weekly show that already feels jam packed with people struggling right. to get on is the bottom line, I guess. Um, and the stuff after aftermath, I talked about it on my it was bonus, bonus episode yesterday. It, it happens so much in AEW. It just kind of becomes people run in and there's numbers game, blah, blah, blah. And it's just kind of there for me at this point. So I, I don't know. Welcome, Jeff Hardy, I guess, but I'm not really interested. But there was nothing wrong with this match. I'm not trying to say there was. It's just exactly what you would expect, which I don't need to see anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this is meh. I would say it's fine, but I think that's being too nice. Um, like, they didn't look bad. It was just, it was the Hardys. Yep. Um, I said it before, and I'll say it a thousand times. If you've seen a Hardys match before, you're not missing anything. Um, sure, it's a little different, varying from opponent to opponent, but it makes a little difference in a match like this where the heels are only controlled to set up a Jeff Hardy hot tag, so he can hit the same offense he's hit every match for the past, like, five years. Pop the crowd, brother. And this is exactly why I didn't want them in AEW. They're the exact opposite of what AEW matches are. They're sports entertainers. <laughs> why aren't they in jazz? I guess they're too old to appreciate Jericho. Um, and, and, like, it's not like they're, it's not like they're someone like, Jericho or like at least Jericho kind of changed right like I feel yeah. like a lot of the WWE guys like they they change they they embrace they embrace the style like Brian um Mox like they they changed they adapted to this style they became better arguably and, like and to be fair the Hardy Boys have in the past too like say what you will but Jeff Hardy did like Willow in TNA I don't know if you've immortal. ever seen it and Matt did um Broken Matt Hardy right which was good 
But now they're just right back to whatever 90s. You could literally copy and paste this in the WWE. And it would 90s, be... 2000 Hardy right. Boys, yeah. Right, and like that's the thing. They're not. They're just rebooting the Hardy Boys, and like it's like they're not going to do any. They're not going to adapt. They're not going to be better. They're not going to be new. They're not going to be different. They're going to do the same offense every match. They're going to have fine matches, and yep. then they're they're going to take up spots from people who deserve it more. Um. AEW has taught me that I am not a big nostalgia person, right? Like it's over and over again the people they bring in. I'm like, I'm not super interested. I'd way rather I think see. I am, but like, just like not. I I'm probably not gonna be nostalgic for them, but I think it it depends. It's like I feel like it's more a thing that can happen like in movies or like I don't know certain returns. But like, I, I don't want think them anything in AEW is gonna bring in the underused talent, right? Don't bring in the people that have had a 25 year career right. and have done everything. Bring in the guy that hasn't been used properly elsewhere and use him properly is what I want. But again, believe it or not, they do not consult me on what they're going to do on their right. show. So yeah. This is what um, we get. And you could call the finish to every match they have that they win. It's Fontaine bomb after the twist of fate. It's good. Awful sucks. They're pretty awful. Um, it's lame. Poor Andrade. Get Free the Hardys. Andrade, man. Yeah. Free Andrade. Get the Hardys out here. Also, I do not like the big tag match they're setting up, which they are right. doing next week. Oh, it is an eight man. Yeah, they, they, yeah. they were That's talking what it about on like. Rampage. Yep. Um, there's no universe, no reality where I want to see Sting team with the Hardy Boys in 2022. Um, but that is again, a fair statement. They I do believe. not consult us. They did. Not. Um, and I also feel bad for Darby Allen now. Like, he's the he's still good. He's the like, veteran whisperer. Like. Poor guy. Yeah. Um. Next we get because what I wanted was a red velvet promo. Who doesn't? Uh, Layla Hirsch. <laughs> I guess. Um. She says she's stuck up for Hirsch. That that's what I have. She stuck up for Hirsch. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny because my my only note: basic mid card feud and a generic but fine promo for Velvet. Nice. Like I like what else do you say? Right. She she said stuff about a feud um, that is yeah. very basic. <laughs> So there you go. Because Hirsch was her friend. Now that she sees what Hirsch has become, she'll put an end to it. She did actually beat Hirsch. And she, oh yeah, because she's of mad the Statlander because distraction. Hirsch smashed Statlander in the head with a turnbuckle, right? So is that I, what happened? I guess this is. Oh right, Statlander. Yeah, that's how mm-hmm. Hirsch won on the the pre-show, right? Right. For some reason, I even so now Red Velvet's getting involved again, but that's fine. You so get... this was there. It was there, and and Hirsch better beat Red Velvet, or I'm going to be annoyed. Are you, are you ready? It was fine. It was fine. No, Velvet beat Hirsch. I'm telling you. Sorry, Velvet, Velvet beat Hirsch. Oh, did? Yeah. Oh. On Rampage, I told you, Statlander. They finally give Hirsch a win, right? And then it's lose lose. Oh yeah, she also lost to Rosa. Huh? Right. So, yeah. anyways, not how I would do things, but again, I'm not consulted on these Speaking decisions. Speaking of Thunder Rosa, right? Main event time. Um. Yep. It's Rosa Baker cage match. Women's world title. We get a big entrance for Rosa, complete with a female mariachi band. I thought that was a really hits. cool touch, and all uh-huh. women's yeah. uh, mariachi band. That was cool. Also, a change for her. She's got full face paint. So yes, kind of cool. And I'm, I and was the crowd pr- super hot for her, actually, right? Yes, they love. Well, she, it's in her hometown. Crowd, yeah, but like they, they were super fired up. And I was hyped for this match too. I, I again, I think the lackluster build, <laughs> considering um, this is a match I thought was money, money, money. I thought they could have built it better, especially a company that does a really good job on slow builds. But I'm still um, pumped for this match for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so Baker's wearing like a black and white gear with like the dripping decal, um, no doubt inspired by Scott Hall. So that that's really cool. Yeah, that's a cool touch. Um, and another violent and entertaining cage match mm-hmm. from AEW. They do a good job with these. They kind of have the <laughs> North American major TV market cornered on bloody extreme matches, right? Because WWE just isn't right. willing to go this far. Yep. Right. And I think they've like sparsed it. Like, they've sparsely placed their cage matches so far. Like, I know there was the tag one, and then what? There was only the Cody Wardlet one right yeah. before that. And I guess if you really wanted to include blood and guts, but I'm going, like, with the, the tried and true cage matches right. here. And yeah, they don't overdo it, right? What they... I like is, like, I think you could climb the cage, but I'm not sure if, like, that's, like, a winning stipulation. I think they even said, like, if Baker were to go, she would lose by count out in the cage match. Which oh, I cool. was interesting. I like that. Um, And I what I kind of liked here was, like, it's the cage was, like, like a smaller version of hell in a cell right because yeah, there's, there's, there's a, room a bit of floor out. space right but then there's no roof so i think it's kind of interesting i I don't mind that no i like it because then you, you could bring weapons which they did so i i kind of like that and then like they can and, and then it's like they don't have to like rip off hell in a cell if they wanted to 
um like they could just go like steel cage match it's all it suits all right because like it, yeah it, i like that they have a bit of floor space and access to under the ring and stuff i like it right i think blood and, no blood and guts had the roof right so there's the differentiation um so rosa grinds baker's face against the cage and attacks her fresh wound with like punches and then goes back at it with the cage rosa was really energetic early on and, and was kind of like playing to the crowd right to get sure. them even more involved she did a good yeah. job there mm-hmm. um and of course baker's bleeding pretty soon um rosa goes after the wound further with crowd count punches uh rosa rams baker in the cage repeatedly a bit of floor space which i noted but i just talked about it's like someone like a hell of a summer match maybe smaller than no roof which again i like and again differentiation from wwe right because they have held a cell which has a bunch of floor space right and then they have a steel cage which is like resting on the apron so again differentiation right yep. which like it's it's subtle and it doesn't matter a lot but i still kind of like that right just yeah me it's too different i did think early on the only part i didn't really enjoy like right around when brit starts bleeding i don't know what was going on things seemed really slow and out of sync and like rosa was struggling to find things to do and then the referee was checking on brit so i don't know if there was some legitimate concern about something but there was just an awkward yeah I little sequence right around slow. brit bleeding and then things obviously picked up so i yeah. wasn't sure because both of these women are really good so there was this little stretch where i'm like why is nobody doing anything but anyways mm-hmm. Um, after the commercial break, Baker's bringing in a little bunch of steel chairs, like a bunch. Yes. Um, Rosa attacks Baker with the chair and then hits a stunner. This was Austin three sixteen day. Um, it was. I think. I think it was the day before. Um, St. Patrick's Day. Cause I think that was Thursday, right? And I could do without hearing so much about Steve Austin Day. People need to look into Steve Austin. He's not the lovable man that you think he is. Um, he's got a history, man. So this just. Anyways, it's my own personal thing. This mm-hmm. nonstop love for him every March 16th is right. a bit much for me. Right, you'd rather celebrate Aaliyah 317 day. Exactly. <laughs> um, Baker inadvertently super kicks the ref, which I thought looked kind of cool, actually. And he gets knocked out of the ring after, off of a victory roll. Um, Rosa then hits her finisher, the fire thunder driver, but the ref is, of course, down, so no falls counted, unless you count the one counted by the crowd, of course. Right. Um, there's an avalanche air raid crashed by Baker onto a pile of chairs, Looked which was really pretty good. nice. Yeah, I liked it. Aubrey Edwards comes in to replace the ref, to count a two count, a female ref and a female match, noise. Yep. Um, Baker stacks a chair tower, because when you have a bunch of chairs... Like open chairs, like kind of builds like a yeah, chair no, pyramid. Yeah, she seats the, yeah. the chairs and she, she makes a chair tower, classic. Um, Rosa rams Baker against the cage and she falls onto the chair tower, which looked pretty nice. There's Rosa's no way that didn't points. hurt a lot. It yeah, had to be painful. That was pretty nice. Yep. Um, Baker once again brings in thumbtacks because she has yet to learn her lesson. Right. Um, Rosa takes a backdrop on the tacks, but her butt took most of the blows, so she's just got like on like one side of her butt just a bunch of thumbtacks. Bunch of so that's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. That'll be a funny wound. Um, Baker looks for the locked up, but Rosa bites on her hand to avoid it, which I thought was like, that's smart. Mm-hmm. Um, and when Baker tries again, Rosa rams Baker's hand and repeatedly attacks again. Uh, right, to try and take away the um, yeah, lockjaw. I, I, really, I really like those two counters. I yeah, thought me that too. was like, like oh, that one, I was like, okay. And then the other one, I was like, and then with the tax, I was like, good use of the surroundings. Like, that was Agreed. cool. Um, Rosa hits a power on a Baker on the tax because Baker had to take the tax. Yep. She had to do it. And then the Fire Thunder driver by Rosa, they said on the tax, but I would say on the outskirts of the tax. Barely. Kind um, of. For the win. Yeah, um, I thought this was another excellent performance from these two. I still enjoyed the lights out considerably more, but I had a great time watching this one too. And I found like, I, my estimate is the final third of this was like really captivating for me. The crowd added to this as well because they were just super into it, obviously. Um, they love Thunder Rosa. It's her hometown, and you've got a super hateable heel as well. So just a really nice dynamic there. The crowd was really loud. Um, and these two, I mean, they're willing to do anything, right? And they, I think they have really good chemistry, and it seemed to build as this went on. So a bloody spot fest for sure with a really hot crowd. I, I thought this was a really strong main event. Again, um, the Lights Out match was pretty much my match of the year. It was in my final two for that. Like, I love that match. I didn't love this one as much, but I still really, really enjoyed it. And I think Britt Baker had a great title run. Um, it is Rosa's time at this point. This title change makes sense to me. Yeah, for uh, sure. My one minor complaint is this feud should have felt even bigger and more important than it did, I think. I think, I've said it a million times, this was the women's match to have in this company and the the match here delivered, but... I think some of the things along the way could have been hotter, could have been built better. Um, I think 
like to use that line, they left some money on the table. Maybe they didn't, but still an excellent match. Just wasn't quite the level of a hot feud. And I don't know if that's because like Thunder Rosa's promos aren't great. You know what I mean? There wasn't a lot of attention right. paid to her side specifically. But nonetheless, a really, really good match. Which is odd, because I think they did a good job building last year. Right. Um, and a super entertaining main event, so I liked it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, another great cage match from AEW. I think the last one was a banger. This one was no different. I think I like the Bucks Lucha Bros one better. But I think oh, this yeah, one was that still one was great. madness. That one was so good. Um, also, a bloody one. Yep. Uh, started a bit slow, but once Baker got busted open, um, and then we came back from the commercial break, I think we got uh, picked up. Yep. A lot of great moments. Um, one of the parts I actually thought was cool was the the lockjaw counters. I thought it was really cool. Kind of begs the question: Wait, everyone doesn't just bite Baker's hand, right? But then I just thought simple. I thought maybe she was just kind of reefing on it, like she's pulling their jaw down. Is the idea? I think right. Yeah, and stopping them from biting. Yeah. So I guess like if she's drunk, like I guess just Rosa had the opportunity. Right. But generally, I like this a lot. I'm not sure if I like this better than the Lions Out match or not. I think both are really good. Um, honestly, I haven't seen that match since we first watched it. So. Yeah. I it could just be memory like I just don't, I I remember it being good and I remember some of the spots but um I think this is really good though um I think if the build was better it would have been perfect but I think and I think it could have been on the pay per view I think this should have been yeah. the pay per view match yeah um but I probably would have I get that they the, want to save some things for probably would have overshadowed the right I'll call it match and you want to have some big um main events for TV yeah scheduled sure. right that's true that's true. Um, this would have been the perfect kind of moment for Rosa, but nonetheless, it was still a really good one, and it was great, I thought. Yep. Um, thoughts on the show? Overall, I thought this was another strong episode of Dynamite. A lot of tag team wrestling, right, if you think about it? Yeah. Um, I don't think there were any bad matches on the show. Like, the Ward Low Sky thing was kind of not really about the match, and it made sense. I thought the opener and the main event were really good. The Danielson Mox tag match and the after match was good as well. Um... The Hardys match was perfectly fine, right? If you wanted to see the Hardys, you got to see the Hardys in a good match. It wasn't my cup of tea, but I wouldn't say the match was bad. Um, Segment-wise is where things were a bit different. Nothing really stood out segment-wise. Um, the the JAS segment was su- the biggest one on the show and was supposed to probably be the big deal, but didn't do much for me. It didn't really connect with me, um, even though I thought Jericho's performance in it was fine. And then everything else was just kind of quick little segments or building minor feuds, so nothing really stood out. So mostly on the strength in ring, I gave this show a B plus this week. I enjoyed it, especially main event and opener. If it had a few more segments of interest to me, it would have been in the A range, so it just fell short to that, but still a a very entertaining show with a B plus this week. Yeah, for sure. Um, Like you said, I really like the opener. I I really like the main event as well. Um, Mox Danielson was solid. Uh, TNT Town match was probably the main down point in in ring. Competition. Oh wait, actually, sorry, I forgot the Hardys. That was nah. uh, that was fine. I thought it was fine. I just didn't want to see it. Screw the Hardys. Um, the jazz segment was too long, and I did not care for it at yep. all. Um, I think there's some solid segments. Like I think FTR was solid. Um, claimed. Uh, don't really care much about the Keith Lee team testing, but it wasn't like horrible or offensive. Um, Cargo's promo was short, like not a ton for segments, to be honest. Was... I like the deep quick one. And... Oh, right. The deep one. Yes, that one was really good, too. Yep. Um, mostly on the strength of the in-ring um, action, but I think I saw it like TV special show. So um, I would give it like a, a B plus. I think it just falls short of the A range. Exactly. I think it was still really good. Me too. I quite enjoyed it. They keep delivering. There was a little lull there in AEW where I was, you know, in the low yeah, Bs and high yeah, yeah. Cs for a bit. They seemed to have rebounded and it was kind of like there was a a few weeks there where they were figuring out where they were going with stories and it seems like they're doing a better job now so another entertaining show all right well let's uh, transition from talking about a specific show into wrestling in general in our trivia segment called off the top of his head all right so we're going back to the book that i have um a couple of the chapters were far too easy for you it was like finishing moves and nicknames or something like that so there's that would not be a challenge at all so chapter six is wrestlemania trivia i figure we can get two weeks out of that as we head into mania um we may have done some of these before i don't know we're now at 87 weeks of me finding trivia so if there's some duplicates listeners i apologize but that's just going to be how it is so I'm not going to remember if there is. Me either. 15 um, questions about WrestleMania history. Ready? 
I know we've had this one before. The first WrestleMania took place in what year? 1985. Correct. I think I watched the whole show now. True or recently, right? We watched. Mm, I watched it recently. I watched the first Mania. I I remember I was on the one. Nice. Yeah. Um, True or false. There has only ever been one steel cage main event at WrestleMania. True. Correct. It was Hogan Bundy. Correct. Which that's the first wrestling thing I remember seeing like vividly. I don't think there's a lot of Mania Keats, but I think the only other one might have been last year with Shane and Braun. Ugh. Um, What, are you dissing the best in the world? uh, Yes. Number three. What superstar has the most wins at WrestleMania? Undertaker. Correct. Not a hard one. Which of these famous boxers served as a guest referee at WrestleMania? Do you even need the names, or do you know? Muhammad Ali. Correct. Muhammad Ali. Mania one. He's an amazing dude. You should look him up, everybody, if you don't. Because he was just an amazing person, let alone probably the best boxer ever. But anyways, what superstar has the most losses at WrestleMania? That's interesting. Triple H. Correct. You knew that. Wow, interesting. I don't know. I I think I just It is Triple H. The guy known for burying everybody has lost the most at mania interesting right uh especially i guess in maybe a few later years number six which superstar has the longest unbeaten streak at wrestlemania oh think about it now do you want your options uh, <laughs> who could it be i mean i might need him okay i'll well undertaker yeah uh, wait, surprise so what are the other options hulk hogan triple h rick flair okay those are solid picks right. i'm not rick flair because he, he was mostly wcw right so. it was as you know undertaker how many editions of WrestleMania have taken place? 37. Correct. I had to adjust because this was published, so it says 36. So you're wrong. You don't know anything about oh, wrestling, okay. as bad. we've established right. on yeah. this show. <laughs> Number eight, which superstar worked? Oh, we're exposing the business in our trivia. Which superstar worked the most matches on a single WrestleMania night? Randy Savage. Correct. Can you explain that to me? Because I don't remember. Um, I think it was like... Four, at least because I was just the, saw. N- well, actually, it was Mania Four, but I mean, I think he also four matches. Um, it was, um, remember, so Andre, um, had like the crook ref and he beat Hogan oh, at Saturday right, right, event. Right. So then he, it was a he sold the tournament. title to, Andre, um, to DiBiase, and then, right, and then they vacated and then they had the tournament. That's right. I did yeah, just see that, that recently, actually. Yeah, I remember. I think I saw a bit of obscure watching it. Right. Uh, number nine, which WWE legend? has featured in the most WrestleMania main event matches. That's an easy one, too. Okay. Correct. Yeah. You um, main event in, like, what? I think it was, like... The first... Eight of nine, few? I think. Yeah. Like, of what? One, two, three, uh, five, six, seven, uh... It's not just counting. He's actually remembering the... Um... Main events Hogan was in. Uh, so we're six of seven. Six of the so, first seven. And then eight... Yeah, eight and nine. So he only missed four. So eight of the first nine. Yeah, he was the main event. Eight of the first nine. Uh, the longest ever WrestleMania match took place between what wrestlers that we just watched oh, right. last night? Yeah, <laughs> Michaels and Hart. Uh, right, hour long Iron Man match plus overtime. Um, um we, yeah, it was on right. It was a uh, ten biggest WrestleMania matches yeah. or whatever. So, so we watched. We, we caught a bit of that. Like I'd yeah. say, like twenty minutes at least. Really good stuff. Yeah. Um, we saw a bunch where Hart was in control, and it was really good. The way he was working Michael's back forever there, right, was cool. Um, number 11, how long did that match last? You already said, but how long was it? An hour, but plus overtime. Right, so. an hour and change. They, they put an hour here, so technically, again, you don't know anything because you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> number 12, which WWE legend has worked the most WrestleMania matches? Kane. No. Undertaker. Yes, Undertaker is yeah, correct. Yeah. I was like, did we not have that question already? But not technically, I guess. Similar. Um, this boxer served as an enforcer at WrestleMania. Mike Tyson. Correct. Mania Tyson, 14. Tyson Fury was one of your options, too. You didn't <laughs> want to take that one? Oh, boy. Here's a hard one. Ready? Take your time. In what month of the year does WrestleMania take place? April. <laughs> correct. It, it is sometimes end of March. Right. Or it has been. 15, final one for this week. True or false? Ooh, a lot Wrestle- of options. WrestleMania 2 is the only WrestleMania event that took place on a Monday. True. It is true. As a ma- I feel like we may have mentioned that one before. I, it feels like the weird kind of fact that we would have that, mentioned Why before. would they put that out there to be <laughs> false, right? Right. Interesting. 
But yes, all right, you did very well, as expected on WrestleMania Trivia. We'll revisit it with part two. That's sort of our palate cleanser between reviewing. So we're going to switch it up. Normally we go any other, or so, normally go NXT UK, which we didn't get around to this week. So I'm going to move NXT into the next slot and then any other wrestling business we won't have on this episode. But you can obviously go listen to the impact I put out yesterday, which would have been what which was... Which is like your supplement. That would have been in any other wrestling business <laughs> if I'd done it all today. So long, short story long, I guess, sorry. I'm going to now talk about this week's lovely edition of NXT 2.0. So I explained yesterday in my bonus episode, my initial thought was to move NXT 2.0 to the bonus episode, but you um, like to listen to me suffer through yes. NXT because you don't watch it anymore. So then I decided I I'd move Impact instead, which was a much better show than NXT 2.0. I even specifically mentioned that in that review. So looking at this week's NXT 2.0, it started with a recap of the triple threat main event from last week where Dolph Ziggler somewhat surprisingly won the NXT championship facing uh, Braun Breaker and Tommaso Ciampa. Um, And then this one starts out with my notes say, Miz TV? Question mark? Really? Question mark? Um, (laughs) So Miz is like, dialed right up to 11 here and is super obnoxious right at the start of this he does calm down a little bit but it was a lot to take right away um he basically hypes his mania match which is i don't even remember who's miz he's teaming with logan paul oh right (laughs) that's why i forgot (laughs) um so he mentions that match before calling ziggler down for an interview uh, Dolph comes down Which with... Which is weird, because remember, these guys have like a history of... Right, feuding but it's all forgotten times. on NXT. <laughs> right. Dolph comes down with Bobby Roode for the interview. Well, Robert Roode. And okay. as it's happening, we get footage of Braun Breaker <laughs> arriving at the building, and he's looking everywhere for Ziggler. Does he not know that the segment's on? Right. And they're mocking Braun for being a rookie, and Roode explains that in a triple threat, which I thought was a reasonable thing oh. here, there are no rules. So they didn't break any rules when Ziggler won the title, right? That's so true. kind of like Braun, you have nothing to be upset about because there's no rules in a triple threat, right? So that made sense to me. Um, LA Knight's music hits. He walks to the ring, gets actually a really nice response from the crowd. Although I'm finding these NXT crowds are up for anything. Like they're just loving whatever's happening. So or I don't, don't forget what they're capable well, they, of with and the pipe in. They pipe in stuff for sure. But you can actually see people cheering. So yeah. that's, that helps. Knight challenges Ziggler for the title tonight since Braun isn't there. Ziggler says he's a fighting champion, but only for superstars. So sort of insulting LA Knight there. Uh, Miz is really condescending tonight before Knight says he's a megastar, not a superstar. And you can take that title anytime he wants. The crowd starts chanting for him. He challenges Ziggler again. Ziggler again says he basically only wrestles main eventers and Knight isn't one. But then... For whatever reason, Miz announces that the match is happening. So Cause anyone can. Well, because like I said, that, that him and Ziggler are longtime rivals, and also anyone can make matches. Anyone well, can make any okay, match. Okay, so by the logic, like, so if anyone in NXT can make matches, right, and a low card or mid card star from main roster can come and just take the title, mm-hmm. then a mid card star like Miz, who's teaming with a celebrity, must have a lot of pull around NXT because he's. He's in a big spot yeah, right now. He so can make any he must decision. He have a lot wants. of pull, right? Yeah, that's so fair. that that's a logical explanation. And so I avoid watching main roster WWE as a rule. So I personally really resent it seeping into NXT. Um, even though NXT has been really bad lately, like it would have made me even more angry in that's the what I was gonna black say. and it gold era. Actually, pissed me off. Like, but if they did um, it my ideal is that NXT is an alternative to main roster, not an extension of it or like even a less polished that version ended of it. a while ago. Right. Because NXT 2.0 feels like it's main roster, but with talent who are really inexperienced and not good at many facets. It could be in ring or out of ring or everything, right? <laughs> um, but this is exactly what you'd expect right. from a Miz TV segment. Uh, I was bored by it for the most part. Um, it felt like it went a long way to make a match for the main event that they could have done differently. I'm not sure. I'm sure they wanted Miz there to push the Mania stuff more than anything because he Miz is like known as the company guy who will do any of extra promotional stuff they ask him to sort of thing. So it seems like this is one of those times, right? Um, so fine. I, 
is this the start of a Miz Knight angle down the road? I'm wondering too, because Knight feels like to me he could be a uh, debut on the Raw after Mania kind of guy for sure, and walk into a feud now with Miz. So, anyways, I don't know, man. This just isn't what I want to see. So I did not like this start to the show at all. So we're already a little bit annoyed right off of the first segment. That's good. <laughs> um, and then we see Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams are walking down to join commentary. Um ahead of the qualifying match for the North American Championship. And then we get Cora Jade. She reveals to us that Raquel Gonzalez, after that toxic attraction t- attack last week, is going to be out four to six weeks. I don't know if that's legit or just a work. I haven't heard, really. And Jade is sure that toxic attraction will be looking for her because she has all of their belts. So they're, the belts are just hanging on, like, a fence or whatever beside her, I guess the okay, idea. Okay, so three and one handicap match for all the gold. And then Cora God. Jade becomes a double champion and they could pull an impact where she's a sole tag team champion. Could be. Yeah. And well, because they have to, she has she to is, fight for one of the belts. And like, she's just an amazing talent, as I've talked about exactly. for weeks on yeah. the show, right? Well, she stole those, so they have to give her a title match. Right? My notes, I thought Jade was less bad here. That's the best I could say <laughs> for her. Um, but her involvement with Toxic Attraction just isn't interesting. Like, again, Toxic Attraction isn't what they were the hoping they would be. I could imagine. And it's too bad that Gonzalez is out. I don't know if that's... Maybe you could fact check that. Is, is Gonzalez actually hurt or is this just storyline? Uh, we then get Santos Escobar taking on Cameron Grimes. In theory, a match that I would like because I like both of these guys and they're both really good in the okay, ring. So the one, sorry, one of the things um, when I search is Raquel, like I haven't finished it yet. Um, there's some other Raquel's, but one of them is, is Raquel Gonzalez single? Nice. That's a big question on everyone's <laughs> mind. Um, so this match, interesting. They're both already in the ring, so no entrances for anybody. And we get a series of kind of acrobatic escapes to start out. And then Hayes is on commentary. Um, he has no good reason for making this multi-man ladder match, right? Especially as a heel, and it's really bugging me. I really like Carmelo Hayes, but... Why is a heel booking himself in a match? It just says what you just told me. Like, he, I can't tell if it's kayfabe or not. So why is a heel booking himself in a match where he has like a huge chance of not retaining, right? So he goes on and on during commentary here about, about giving people opportunities um, and announces what each of the qualifying matches are, which I didn't write down because I don't really care that much. But again, this is not a heel character. I don't understand what he's doing. Oh, I, can, I got it. Um, because I was just looking at the updated yeah. stand and deliver cards, so it'll one of them. It's Solo Sokoa versus Roddy, right? And A Kid versus Waller, and then two right. more to be confirmed. Because A Kid had a match on this show to earn the match to face Waller. Is that what it was? Yes. So a qualifier for a qualifier. Correct. That's nice. Which all booked by Carmelo Hayes, because he has the power. Wrestlers be booking, superstars be booking everything mm-hmm. on this show. Sports entertainers. Um. They don't really talk about this match at all on commentary to start, and it's really frustrating. It kind of takes me out of it. Even, like, Escobar and Grimes seem to be aware that nobody's talking about anything, so they're working really, really slowly to start, which I also didn't love. Um, Obviously, distraction by Legato leads to Grimes getting taken out on the apron, down to the floor. Later, Grimes hits his moonsault crossbody thing for a near fall. Escobar counters the cave-in into a phantom driver for the clean win, after about 11 and a half minutes um because grimes kind of took the time to taunt hayes before going for the cave-in and then hayes or sorry not hayes um escobar oh no was it hayes who's taunting him yes sorry he was taunting hayes from commentary and then sort of gets caught in the phantom driver and loses so i i mean i i expected a lot more from these two i don't think this was really bad but it started really slowly with commentary not talking about any parts of the match, which kind of took me out of it. The middle seemed out of sync at points a little bit. I think overall it was fine, but not a standout at all. I don't mind Grimes losing, but his cave-in's been kind of protected, right? So I didn't love that it was just so easily countered into a finisher here. Uh, Wouldn't have been the choice I made. I mean, it was a decent opener, but these two are capable of way better match, in my opinion. Um, we then get a talking segment with EO and Kaylee Ray. They want to destroy Toxic Attraction, and winning the Dusty Cup is the best way to do that because it'll earn them a tag title shot, I guess. Um, they talk about neither of them have many friends, but they do have a mutual enemy. They want the titles. Um, I don't know. It was fine, but it uh, 
the way it was shot i didn't really like the camera work on this one made it feel a bit cheesy it's like they're having the the film crew experiment with some stuff and the camera was kind of moving around and in and out and i didn't really love it but i don't know it was a pretty standard promo i guess we then move to wendy chu and dakota kai and they seem to be on the same page now but toxic attraction interrupt and want to know where jade and all their belts are Toxic Attraction are basically the mean girls to Chu and Kai, and then they leave, and Kai and Chu say, I think it's Chu who says, they are hot, but they're weird. Like, is weird the adjective you would use here as the, they just constantly bully people? I would say repulsive. I would just say, like, bullies or mean or whatever. Like, weird is not... Anyways, um, Dakota Kai's character seems to have shifted, and she and Chu are a unit now, and my notes are, imagine if they had explained this somehow. Like, tried to st- tell us a story or something, right? But no, it's just like, now Dakota Kai and Chu are on the same page. We're going to ex- offer you no explanation. We don't care about building any sort of story. Just trust us. They're now a team. Okay, great. Um, we get a brief little A-Kid video ahead of his debut match here in NXT. And it is A-Kid taking on Kushida. And this is where commentary tell us that the winner of this will face Grayson Waller for a qualifying match for the North American title. And Barrett... <laughs> I wrote this down because it made me laugh. Barrett actually says that Carmelo Hayes should be the GM of NXT. Well, he kind of is at this point, right? He's booking a whole bunch of (laughs) matches. So we get some mat work to start with no real advantage. Lots of nice submissions and counters to no advantage as well. Kushida gets control, applies a Boston Crab. We get the palm strike that's countered into a German suplex by A-Kid, and he follows with a bridging Northern Lights for a two count. Kushida is attacking A-Kid's arm. And then eventually the finish comes when it wasn't the cleanest execution, but A-Kid hits that sort of back-flipping DDT um, to, to Kushida and pins him after five minutes. <laughs> so um, nice. I feel like Kushida's sort of tumbling down the card here, right? It, it was a really good five-minute match. It did build nicely um, with just enough holds and counters at the beginning. A-Kid looked really good showcasing his speed and technical skills. I don't know why it only got five minutes. It feels like they could have gotten more time for sure. Um, and I, I bet I can suggest several things that they could have cut from the show and put that time into this match, but they didn't. And my question for you, has Ikem and Jiro sort of dragged Kushida down to enhancement status? Because it sure felt like it here. Yeah, like, probably. He got like a slightly competitive five-minute match. I don't think Kushida stood much of a chance anyways. No. Um, but any, it, for a five-minute match, it was actually pretty good. So next we have... Escobar, Santos Escobar is telling us he's the greatest luchador of all time and that stand and deliver will be his time. And if you say you're the best luchador of all time, apparently that summons Rey Mysterio because he and Dominic show up and I'm groaning again because... Yeah, see, like, this just made no sense to me. Like, no advertising. Well, because he said he's the greatest luchador of all time. Boom, you have summoned Rey Mysterio. Spawns him. That's right. Um, so again, I what Spawn Ziggler. Ray puts over Dominic as the next great luchador. Okay. Um, and then Mendoza and Dominic will have a match. And I am inching closer, my notes, and I am inching closer to quitting NXT the more it becomes an extension of main roster. I hate this. Do it. Uh, we get a recap of the juvenile Tiffany Stratton Saray necklace feud over the last couple of weeks. They edit Saray's sort of weak attack from last week that cost Tiffany Stratton a match where I think it was either a knee strike or a kick to the back of whoever's head. Um, the bartender girl. Do you remember her name? Uh, Henley. Fallon Henley. There you go. Her, Why I think. do I know that? That's sad. Um, so we do get Tiffany Stratton versus Saray here. Um, Saray starts to do her transformation entrance, but she gets attacked from behind by Stratton before Saray can transform, which I thought was very smart. Right? Makes sense. Um, um, well, the transformation doesn't make sense, but I guess that makes sense in the right. nonsense. Goal. Oh, the transformation bugs me, and I think it's ridiculous, but Stratton's heel strategy right. here is strong, right? I thought. Um, so Saray has to wrestle this match in her schoolgirl outfit. I saw that, so that, that makes sense. Then, I was wondering <laughs> why. Um, and then it made me laugh because commentary literally say the words, quote, Saray not able to transform. <laughs> and they have to say that like they're serious actual commentators, right? So that was amazing to me. The match starts. Stratton dominates with strikes early on. Saray misses that low drop kick she goes for um, with her opponent against the ropes. And she takes the Stratton tumbling corner cr- splash and then the corkscrew Vader bomb. And the match is over in less than a minute. Um, 
So I actually thought this was a super clever move for the heel to make, attack Saray and force her to wrestle the match in her sort of timid pre-transformation persona, right? So Stratton gets a dominant win. This obviously can extend this feud with Saray because Saray's need going to need to get her win back as, what is her gimmick when she's transformed uh, warrior of the sun or yeah. something like that I, I can't, is it yeah i got it right yeah wow um so i think saray's gimmick is dumb with the whole transformation but i thought this was a clever way to deal with it here for the heel so there you go i said something good about the writing in nxt right there <sighs> right uh, hey i'm gonna give him credit when credit's due i thought that was a clever use of that ridiculous gimmick of saray's so we now get walter approaches la Knight backstage Walter doesn't respect Knight and accuses him of using his mouth and not his skills to get championship matches, which seems fair. Knight questions Walter's charisma, how dare you, and says that it's sports entertainment, gross, and that Walter has the first half of that, the sports part, but that Knight has the whole package. That's nice. So he's going to join JAS, apparently. He's going to... Jazz. <laughs> go to AEW and join Jericho. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... These two are definitely a contrast, right? Like all Walter cares about is in-ring stuff and Knight is clearly all about entertainment and a little bit about in-ring. So that's cool, but openly talking about how it's sports entertainment does bug me a little bit. Like it bugs you in AEW, right? Like to be like, yeah. I'm the better sports entertainer and that's what matters. Like, I don't know. These are conversations. Like I could, even though that is WWE, like I still don't think it needs to be said. I could do without those conversations for sure. Right. But I think the angle between these two could work if that's where they're going. And I would hope that it's Walter beating Knight on Knight's way out sort of thing would be nice if he puts Walter over. But we'll see where it goes, I guess. Um, so back to Cora Jade and the toxic attraction angle that litters this program this week. So Cora Jade, did you see this? She traps JC Jane in a cage using one of the belts as bait. And my notes are dot, dot, dot. That's nice. Cool, question mark. <laughs> It's the only... Makes sense for grown people, right? I'll talk about all of them later, but that's what happens. Basically, the belt's hanging at the back of this, whatever. JC Jane walks in, Cora Jade closes the door and locks it. And then for some reason, there's a camera angle inside the cage looking out at Cora Jade. So interesting placement for a camera. But Yeah, how did the camera guy get right? in there? Um, so Champa then comes down to the ring to talk. He's here to talk about gratitude. This was super lengthy, and I majorly shortened it. So if you want to hear Champa's almost feels like his like leaving speech sort of thing, you can check that out on your own. But he talks about his lengthy history in wrestling and in NXT. Thanks to fans, they thank him. They beg him not to go. Champa's one, Champa wonders how to close this chapter, and the crowd chant one more match. So good old Tony D'Angelo ends up in oh, the ring. Oh, that's why they're facing off. It's his put-over match. I think it feels like it. With uh, his tire iron, he says that he could have hit Champa in the head. Iron. He could have hit Champa in the head, but he was crowbar or whatever it is. But he respects him. He wants to beat Champa to become a made man in NXT. He offers his hand. They shake hands briefly. Then he knees Champa low. Um, D'Angelo makes the match for stand and deliver because that's what you do. That just is what mind. you do. That However, literally is what you there do. Is, no, there's, there's one performer who hasn't figured that out, and I'll talk about oh, it very shortly. Really? So this was a really long but strong, seemingly heartfelt message. Uh, if this were NXT black and gold, then this would have been a more emotional promo for me. But because NXT is a shell of its former self and has moved past experienced talent like Champa, his leaving is less significant of a tragedy, right? Like in old NXT, it would be like, oh my God, he's going from a place that uses him correctly and respects his abilities. And now it's like he has nowhere to go. And now it feels more like a lateral move, right? Like you're going to be misused wherever you go. So yeah. it doesn't really make that much difference to me. Right. Um, so good luck to him. But WWE offers zero interesting programming right now. So I don't see much of a chance for him. We then get the, um, the mega powers explode here. Indy Hartwell taking on Persia Parada. So let me ask you, I, I can't remember you seeing Mega Powers explode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen opponents come to the ring together? Because that's what happened here. Yeah, Hardys. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, I, I thought it was. Once before. 
I, I was wasn't sure if it happened. But that before. was because like it was, I don't know why they're facing off, but they were like still on good terms. So I find it weird that they did it here because they're kind of like disagreeing, right? So they they're... are, but I think the point was before the match, they're still kind of on the same page that this is like the the final straw sort of thing. I think. Okay. I guess I don't. Who knows what they're up to? I know here. it's happened before. I know at least the Hardys, and then I don't know if there's. I probably just instance. put more thought into it there than they did, to be honest. <laughs> um. So Indy runs the ropes early. Persia misses a kick that Indy has to sell anyways. I don't know if it was just <laughs> the camera angle or lack of goodness by people, but it was a miss anyways. Barrett puts over the Persia Duke Hudson romance a lot at the beginning here, and it's really annoying and sad. Um, Persia taunts Indy mid-match to make sure we know who the heel is here. Hudson obviously shows up, distracts Indy as she's on the apron, but good old Dexter Loomis crawls out from under the ring and that sort of causes a larger distraction, and Indy ends up rolling up Persia Parada for the win in less than... Three minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you still know the line. So distraction roll up, three-minute match. That is NXT formula. We Copy and paste. Um, so then, and I can't believe I'm saying this, the couples pair off and have a makeout competition. They start out just kissing, and then it's like down to the mat, Indy ripping off Loomis's shirt and jumping on top of it. I saw the one clip of that, like where they're just like kissing. Um, and it looks like so bad. It looks like Loomis is just standing there and Indy's doing all the work. Like it doesn't look like Loomis is doing anything. I hate to like actually like analyze that, but like <laughs> just like the surface observation I mean, where it looks like, I mean, it all around looks crappy. Like they're it's just terrible. not at, like it looks very fake, but like it just looks like Loomis is doing nothing like and he's just going like and he's just, just not doing anything. that which... does fit his gimmick yeah, though but, right <laughs> like, like, i guess yeah um, i guess so. so again less about the match than the angle after and that's a shame because the angle is a steaming pile of juvenile crap that i can barely stand at this point i imagine we're getting a mixed tag match at stand and deliver so something Ooh. you can check maybe that's already been announced not something i'm interested in um crap like this this is the stuff that really overshadows anything positive that happens on these shows because these are what I end up remembering, right? Like 12-year-old romance angles, basically, in the middle of the show. But anyways, um, Gigi Dolan, she gets trapped in a dumpster by Cora Jade I after Jade uses the other tag team belt as bait. Um, so Jade taunts Gigi before saying two down and one to go. So... This is really stupid, but I guess it was really quick. The fact that Toxic Attraction walks straight into what are very obvious traps makes them look really dumb. Um, especially since I would suggest that... It's like a Home Alone or something, except it's, it's just like dumb. It's like Scooby-Doo, right? They had to go <laughs> split up. They got to split right. up to go find the ghost. And I don't even think Jade looks smart because these are ridiculously obvious traps that like a child would set up for somebody, right? Like, right. oh, here's... The Literally. belt is hanging off the door of an open dumpster. Come get it. Like, right. And they fall for it, obviously. But anyways, uh, the traps work. This is really stupid. So Dominic Mysterio is taking on Raul Mendoza in Mysterio's NXT 2.0 debut match, I guess. <laughs> Fallon Henry's there. He should Henley, have been here sorry. like a while ago. So Fallon Henley shows up, takes out, what's her name? Electra Lopez at ringside. Yeah. And Jensen and Briggs then come down to join as well. So basically, Dominic dominates, overcomes the distraction of Legato to win in... Under three minutes. Correct. Yeah. With the 619 and the frog splash. So this was nothing other than further evidence of the standing of the NXT roster, right? That you're just garbage. And if anybody from main roster comes down, you're doing the job and you're doing the job quickly. I guess, I guess the argument is that Mendoza is at least a tag team wrestler who doesn't really win ever anyways. So it's not really off-brand for Mendoza to lose, but right. he still lost to somebody who I think still largely a developmental wrestler, right, um, in three minutes. So, great, I guess. Another nothing match on this show. We get a Scott Hall Remembrance video. Basic theme, I think, was it's good to be bad or something like that. It was fine. Cora Jade is about to then spray paint Mandy Rose's car in the parking lot. So, she, get this. She's NWO gonna, reference, I guess. I guess. And you know what? You know what's a good idea? When you know her vehicle is white, you bring white spray paint. Oh, my God. Really? That makes so much sense. Yeah, because I saw her get spray painted with white. <laughs> so then me. I'm not quite sure what's happening because Jade changes her mind and gets in the car. So A, the car is unlocked. And B, is she expecting to drive away in it? Like, I don't. But then Mandy, of course, is in the backseat and appears behind her. 
and attacks her, takes her out of the car and beats I thought her. Thought you were gonna say chokes her like a serial killer. Beats her in the parking lot. So <gasps> parking lot. Mandy reveals that she will fight Jade if she wants, that Jade is not on her level, and then Mandy takes the spray paint and spray paints something on Jade's back. I don't know if it was supposed to look like I saw it, but I didn't catch it. It ended was. up just looking like a pile of paint. I thought maybe yeah. she was trying to write TA across the back, but you couldn't really tell. Oh, the, oh yeah. And then Dolan and Jane apparently escape their traps because they show up and end this segment mercifully. Um, a Jade Rose match sounds like a terrible idea, but that makes total sense. It sounds like the worst match. Makes total sense in NXT, right? Yep. So away we go. Mm-hmm. Um, the Creeds hit the ring and want to know who attacked them last week. MSK come out in NWO shirts, which was a nice little touch, and say it wasn't them. But the crowd chants BS, basically, because the crowd hates MSK still it's so weird. in this facility. Um, I think now it's just become like what you do. Even if you don't really care about Izzy or whatever, you're just like, oh, yeah, we're funny. We boo these baby faces because that's yeah. what you do in this place. Um, Malcolm Bivens revi- reminded MSK that they cut the line and that the Creed brothers deserve the next opportunity since they won the Dusty Cup. Imperium come out sort of in the stands and insult both of the other teams. Eichner finally says that they'll put the titles on the line in a triple threat match at Stand and Deliver. Yep. So MSK Creed Brothers versus Imperium. Bartel tries to end by justifying heels booking themselves in a match that's terrible for them, in theory. So yet yeah. again, let's recap this, right? We've had heel champion Mandy Rose, who's doing a take-on-all-comers idea. She even took a triple threat match when she didn't need to, right? With she Gonzalez did. and Jade. You've got heel champion Carmelo Hayes, booking himself in a multi-man ladder match for the title. Which is dumb. I feel like at least with Hayes, though, you have the caveat that, like, he's, like, going to hold this, this whole A champion. But he's not a heel. Right, like, but, like, he would want to be, like, A champion. Like, oh, I'm getting defended in a ladder match. Then you're a baby face. I guess. I in know. my opinion. I'm just old school, I guess. Now we have... No, I get what you're saying. Now we have heel tag team champions. They've booked themselves in a triple threat match for the title. So what the hell is going on here? It's now either, he's an NXT champion. It's either laziness or poor planning at the very least. You have multiple champions doing the same thing, right? So that in itself isn't great writing. And at worst, you're blowing up traditional heel dynamics for it's no reason. It's not even like that they don't like... Like, they have authority figures on main roster. I don't get why they don't want one here. Just even, like... They're like, why can't they just even say, like, do the old cliche, like, oh, management has informed us that this is made, right. made official. Like, why does, like... Yep. The it executive to committee got together, and this is a match. And like, oh, we're gonna throw an MSK in the match. Like, why does it have to and be heels, them deciding? Heels making a match is one thing, but making matches where your percentage chance of winning is very low. Steiner match. Like making all these matches where you don't have, like they always say, you don't even have to be involved in the finish, right? Like, why exactly. would heels do that? Right. Um. So, I don't know. It just feels like they can't actually write yourself to the result you want so you're just kind of like we'll just go there we want to get these people in a match so we'll just do it and it doesn't have to make sense who cares no one's watching or whatever um it really feels like they've decided what matches will be at stand and deliver and they just don't care how they get they're just, there they're just getting there yeah exactly uh even tony d'angelo made his own match for stand and deliver tonight right so right. everybody is making their own matches and it just feels lazy except next segment cameron grimes He's disappointed he's not in a match at Stand and Deliver. And he feels like he's disappointed his father. So this is another example we always say of the dumb baby face, right? Look around, man. What everyone else is doing. Just make a match. Just call somebody out and say you're going to fight them at Stand and Deliver. It only works for heels, I guess. I don't know. Like, uh, like any, like anyone. Like, everybody's make it booking their own <laughs> matches and Grimes is like, oh, shucks, I lost another match. Choose any- it's not like Seth Rollins where he's like, say he's going to miss Mania or whatever. Like, he, he, he can just make a match. Like, like, I just listed like four or five examples of people just like, making their own matches and Grimes just can't figure like, that like, out. Like, mid-card guy he could face. Like, like Trick Williams or... Like, anyone. He could go anyone. Like, anyone at all. I cannot emphasize. Just pick anyone but, and face them. But he can't figure that out because he is dumb. Why Suffers can't? from dumb baby face syndrome. DBS. He should just argue his way into the ladder match again because they can just make matches. if. And maybe he'll get like a second chance match to they get in it. I don't do know. That. But it's possible. But anyways, I thought this was just really dumb after all of the other stuff that's happening. Um, Grizzled Young Veterans and Enafe and uh, Malik Blade 
are backstage with Malcolm Bivens, who tries to accuse them of attacking the Creed brothers in his quest to figure out who it was. And Afe and Blade sort of deny it while talking about Mandy Rose as much as possible, because oh that's God. their gimmick. And the grizzled young veterans swear they are innocent as well. The Creeds then show up. Bivens suggests Grizzled Veterans versus Creed Brothers for next week, and Grizzled Young Veterans accept. So Grimes is literally like bookended by people making <laughs> matches. <laughs> it's going to make me cough, sorry. Um, but he can't figure that out himself, right? <coughs> so Bivens books a match here now too. That's funny. And I would say it's another heel, but I honestly don't know what Diamond Mine are still. I think they're kind of I think heel. they kind of fill whatever role they need to. They're like, they're like tofu. They take on the flavor of whatever's <laughs> in the dish, right? Um, and if there's a baby face face in them, they're heels. If and not, they, they're and they have little character, so they have little flavor. Like tofu. That is true. And they're they not, take the flavor. That's, right? They lack yeah. flavor of their own, they're for sure. They're wrestling tofu. Yes. Good wrestlers, though. Um, so then we get to the main event. It's LA Knight versus Dolph Ziggler for the NXT Championship here. So Knight hits a big shoulder tackle to start out, but Ziggler takes control off of a sneaky sort of kick to the midsection. Back elbow by Knight stops Ziggler. Knight starts some arm work here. Knight flips out of a suplex, hits a neckbreaker as Knight sells his ribs from the match he had last week. Um, we get a Famouser that's countered into a slam by Knight. And then we cut to the parking lot and oh no, Braun Breaker has arrived. <gasps> Superplex by Ellie Knight, the one where he like quickly runs up the ropes kind of thing. It right. looks pretty impressive. Knight avoids a rude distraction, slams Ziggler. But Ziggler gets his foot up on the ropes. Um, Rude, I had to check. I thought Rude put it there, but he didn't. It was Ziggler getting it up there on his own. So basically the finish, they avoid each other's finishers before Knight runs into a super kick, which apparently is now what Ziggler's winning matches with. with He's done that before. It makes people look lame, I think. When you watch matches where there's like 10 super kicks and then, anyways. um, Ziggler wins this match in 12 minutes, no surprise. Braun Breaker's music hits. He walks to the ring. He wants his rematch at Stand and Deliver. And I was like, they didn't already book that? Like, I don't, I guess I missed Except it. It's only been a week. I guess. So he decks Rude and Ziggler. Sorry, he decks Bobby Rude and Ziggler agrees to the match because that's what everybody does here. Um, so I, it was a fine match between. Babyface making a match. Babyface making a match. Come on. J- just not Grimes. Like, ridiculous. Can't figure it out. So a fine match, two experienced performers, right? A solid NXT main event, but nothing super special. Like, it was a good match, but it wasn't amazing. Knight did get a lot of offense in, um, but then lost to a single super kick, which bugs me a little bit. Does feel to me like LA Knight could be leaving. There's speculation that a lot of people are leaving, right? Like, I'm hearing maybe Champa, maybe Knight. Um, Dunn's already gone. Dunn is gone. There were some other people I heard as well uh, that might be on their way out. I guess not Breaker because he'll probably win the title. Back. No, Breaker might be going sooner than later as well. It, yeah, but it feels like. Win. Oh, Harland. Harland. They do the vacate, vacate the title deal. True. Pop. I heard Harland. Yeah, that too. I heard he might be leaving. So we sh- we'll see. Could be a bunch of um, people after Mania going up, possibly. Not that I care anymore. So overall, I still dislike this episode, but on the plus side, it was for somewhat different reasons, right? From normal. Um, Partly because this was an extension of main roster, and that's something I specifically avoid and don't want any contact with. So we got The Miz, we got Ziggler again, and we got The Mysterios. So a lot of main roster stuff here that I don't care for. In, <clears throat> in addition, we got a steady dose of wrestlers making their own matches, except Grimes. And that's <laughs> becoming really annoying to me. As, as I said, especially the heels booking multi-person, multi-team matches that don't favor them. Uh, and then, as usual, we get several three-minute or less for Saray, meaningless matches, um, and the usual juvenile storytelling, right? So this show consistently feels so much longer than two hours. Like, watching Impact this week was a joy compared to this, because I'm always shocked. Like, I'll check the time, and I'll be like, oh, my God, I'm only 50 minutes into this, and it feels like it's been hours already. But anyways, short, meaningless matches, uninspired writing, and the chaos of nobody being in charge as they sort of race towards stand and deliver and are just seemingly like here's the card we want doesn't matter how we get there we have no respect for our fans they're idiots so it doesn't matter just throw it all together and we'll get there the pacing on this show felt nuts to me especially compared to impact that was much much better so another bad show consistently bad d plus this week um i thought the main event was fine and the Kushida A-Kid was a good five-minute match, and that keeps them from failing. But the rest of this was very forgettable and far too much main roster um, seeping into NXT for my taste. So another quite bad episode of NXT. I almost called it Impact. Impact was good. NXT Ooh. bad. 
Anyways, that's going to bring us to normally this would be any other wrestling business. But again, we're cutting that out this week because I sort of released it separately yesterday. So go check that out. And we will move directly into our final segment, which is where Jack's going to update us on the world of wrestling action figures in figuring it out with Jack. Um, so there's not much. There's a few things. Um, they had like this ringside, um, like pop up thing at like a, I think a couple WalMarts in America. It's like this experience thing where like you can take a picture of that the ATV or whatever. I don't. Know, it's it's something. But they had a, some figures on showcase, and there's a few new ones. There's this Elite ninety five J- Jimmy Uso, which um, it's just like the proto figure, so it's like on display there. It looks. Almost exactly like the Jay Uso figure they just released. That makes sense. Except I'm not. No, but like, yeah, there's a difference. But like the hair, it looks like Jay Uso's hair. Like, right. That's so not Sokoa. That's not Jimmy. <laughs> it's just like the it's just like the Jay Uso hair with red in it. Now. And I and it's I, like the black hair. Like this is not Jimmy. Speaking of accessories, I heard that that um was it four wheeler ATV that they introduced as a toy did make its way onto the yeah, show a couple times. But it's in toy form first, right? Yep. Like they did with... The car. Right. So it seems something like they... Else. they on the motorcycle. motorcycle. Yep. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So they put out the toy first. They and did. then Yeah, interesting. Of course. Um, and so he also has the tag title on the Uso's hat. Like this looks like a J figure. And like uh, maybe the tattoos will differentiate it, but like this is a J figure. Right. It, they say it's Jimmy and it does. It's, not, it's never looked less like Jimmy. <laughs> like it, it's J. Um, the one figure, the one new figure that they showed that was pretty cool is, um, uh, the gate, they had a new Elite 94 Edge, which is in the white and red gear, remember from Mania last yep. year? So that's really cool, because I, I'll probably get that, because I like, I like the white gear. White gear is always sick. Um, new head scanning, it's like kind of snarling. Um, they gave him like the, the, uh, Daniel, um, Daniel Bryan torso. Which I don't think they should have given him. Like they gave him Interesting. like you know the torso that they used for Seth Rollins. Yeah, they should use that one for him. Um, Would have made sense. Yeah, cause he he well he's been more Jack since he came back. You know what I mean? Or yeah, like, that's true. Right. So, um, I think he's got a rubber jacket, which kind of sucks. But I think like the figure itself looks very nice. The red and white. So I think it's really nice ripping our colors. I guess. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I think that figure is actually really nice. And there's the Stephanie McMahon Helmsley figure. Nice. Um, Elite ninety four. That's there. It um, exists. And then it's they a had, thing that exists. They had protos for the Ruthless Aggression Elite, which was Lesnar, um, Batista, and Michaels. The Batista looks like it comes with a lamp for some reason. A lamp? I'm sure it's from some segment. And then I think Michaels comes with a ring bell, which is kind of cool. Weird. And then the Unspeed title with Lesnar. So that's, those are cool. And they also showed the Superstars line, um, which are just like different scale figures. They're kind of weird. Um, yeah, that's it. That is it? That is it. Well, that's going to bring us to... A little bit shorter. I was joking about how we could talk about wrestling one thing and it'll be two hours. No matter what we do, it's two hours. So yep. we're at the 202 mark here. Um, and yeah, thanks for battling through sort of the COVID edition of the FNS Wrestling Podcast. We should be back to normal next week. If there's any sound and voice issues this week, that should be all fixed for next week because now everybody seems to be negative in the house and hopefully full recovery by next Saturday. So we appreciate any time you spend listening to us talk about wrestling. If you'd like to contact us, fnswrestling at gmail.com or on Instagram at fns underscore wrestling underscore podcast. Um, you can leave a comment in YouTube as well. I'd love to hear from anyone. I promise I will get yeah. back to you. Um, so again, check out the impact review I put out yesterday and we will be back here next Saturday for episode 88 of the main show. Ooh, 88. That's a nice sound. We, like that. Right. We hope to see you all then and bring some friends with you. Tell somebody about us if you could. It would help us out. And again, thanks for listening. We'll see you next Saturday. And until then, take care. <laughs>